Welcome. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to um, our second day of this exciting workshop, Developing Wearable Technologies to Advance Understanding of Precision Environmental Health. On behalf of the Standing Committee for Emerging Science for Environmental Health Decisions, I'm just really glad that you have all been able to join us here today. Um, I am the co-chair of the Standing Committee, and my name is Kristen Malecki. I'm Division Director of Environmental and Occupational Health Sciences at the University of Illinois at Chicago. Today, we have um, a little bit about our committee. I just wanted to, for those of you who didn't join us yesterday, I just wanted to quickly give you um, a little bit of oversight into what we do in emerging science for environmental health decisions. We really aim to examine scientific advances that can be used to help bridge environmental health sciences with understanding environmental impacts on human health. And we understand our world is changing rapidly, and we really need to be forward thinking about how do we take advantage of all of the amazing um, scientific and technological advances that are happening in order to support um, better protection of human health. And to do this, we facilitate communication amongst government, industry, environmental groups, and the academic community, and we host several workshops throughout the year. If you're interested in finding more about, out about what we do, please visit the National Academy of Sciences website. And importantly, I want to note that this activity is made possible through generous support from the National Institute for Environmental Health Sciences. We have an amazing committee of um, standing committee on the use of environmental emerging decisions or emerging science for environmental health decisions um, that we have a 16 member group made of, up of both academics, as well as um, practitioners at the state and local level. We also have federal government liaison group that supports the work that we do that we consult with on a regular basis to advance this work. For this um, workshop, we have a workshop planning committee that is listed here. Dr. Haber, who, Rima Haber from the Keck School of Medicine has chaired this workshop along with um, many of the other excellent uh, speak folks here on the panel. And they've been working really hard to make this a positive experience. And yesterday, if that was um, any sign of their hard work, was, a, was an excellent introduction to this workshop. So yesterday we really covered um, the possibilities of wearables, how wearables can help in environmental and biomedical research. And we saw several different examples of um, ongoing use of wearables and new research that's advancing with that. Today, we really want to move um, even further forward in uh, exploring how wearable applications can be used in the biomedical context, in disease monitoring, interventions, and how that intersects with environmental health sciences. And then we also really wanna take a very practical look at how do we move the use of these wearables into um, implementation. So we'll be talking about adaptation, communication, and other potential barriers or strategies by which we can move all of this new technology into practical cost-effective solutions for advancing environmental health sciences. So just a few quick housekeeping rules. This is a public webcast and workshop to discuss and exchange um, data and ideas. We really want folks to be active participants. There is a chat box underneath the webcast video for you. So please submit your questions there. Um, so the comments and made and ideas shared during the workshop should be attributed to the individual speakers and not their organizations unless otherwise stated. All of this should not be interpreted as the opinion of the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, except for these housekeeping rules. Um, please feel free to share the work that's happening on social media, and the full workshop will be recorded um, with a brief written summary of the workshop published within a few months. So without further ado, I want to move us towards the um, second day of this exciting workshop, Developing Wearable Technologies to Advance Understanding of Precision Environmental Health. And with that, I will introduce you to Dr. Akane Sano from Rice University, who will be leading our first session. Hey, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to about session three on exploring wearable application in other research areas, such as disease monitoring, interventions, and biomedicine. Uh, my name is Akane Sano. I'm uh, assistant professor at Rice University. Uh, today, we will be hearing from five speakers, uh, Dr. Suruti Mahalinga uh, from Harvard, Dr. Lauren Chan from Apple, Dr. Uh, Jesslyn Dunn from Duke University, Dr. David Armstrong from University of South California, 
and Dr. Vena Mishra from North Carolina State University in this session. Uh, so first of all, I will introduce our first speakers, uh, Dr. Maharin Gayer and Dr. Chan. Dr. Shruti Maharin Gayer is Assistant Professor of Environmental, Reproductive and Women's Health at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. She serves clinically as a physician at the Massachusetts General Hospital in the Department of Obstetrics and uh, Gynecology, where she specialized in ovulation disorders, reproductive endocrinology, and infertility. Her research seeks to understand the links between environmental and modifiable risk factors on human reproduction and gynecological diseases. Dr. Maharin Geyer is a creator of ovulation and menstruation health study and one of the principal investigators of the Apple Women's Health Study. Additionally, she was awarded the 2016 Endocrine Society Early Investigator Award and the Edison Family Foundation Award. Uh, next, uh, I will introduce Dr. Lauren Chen. Dr. Lauren Chan is a physician on the Apple team, uh, on the health team at Apple, working across health initiatives and is passionate about its mission toward empowering users to live better and healthier lives. She continues care for patients as a faculty member at Stanford Medicine. Dr. Chen was a co-founder of the Stanford Center for Digital Health and played a large role in the implementation and rollout of telemedicine and digital health across Stanford. She completed her BA at Brown, her post baccalaureate at Harvard, and her Doctor of Medicine and MBA at UC Irvine. So we would like to invite Dr. Mahalinga and Dr. Chan to start their presentations. Thank you so much for the opportunity to present today. Uh, we will be discussing the Apple Women's Health Study in the context of developing wearable technologies to advance the understanding of precision environmental health. The Apple Women's Health Study is funded by Apple, um, and I am supported by this and other research grants. We'll briefly discuss menstruation and environmental exposures, the Apple Women's Health Study, and exposure and outcome assessment through digital tools. The menstrual cycle is a very complex um, process that involves multiple organs and organ systems. Endocrine signaling is required in order to communicate between those tissues and organ systems. Critical um, organs and tissues include the hypothalamus, pituitary, and ovaries, and of course, the um, functioning of the thyroid and adrenal glands. Endocrine disruption can happen at the level of endocrine signaling, or it can happen through direct toxicity at um, any of these tissues. And it's important to consider exposure at critical or vulnerable time points across um, the lifespan. Individuals today who menstruate may be able to um, monitor their own menstrual cycle and ovulation using a variety of at-home tools, including urinary testing for luteinizing hormone, which um, signals for ovulation, or progesterone, the hormone that signals that ovulation has happened, basal body temperature, um, menstrual cycle um, tracking through either an app or through paper logging, and um, some may also uh, perform blood testing for um, some hormones. In addition to this, there is um, the opportunity for using sensor-based data to facilitate um, understanding the cycle. I wanted to introduce the Apple Women's Health Study, which um, is a study that involves um, individuals who are 18 years or older and who have menstruated once, um, who have an iPhone and live in the United States. Um, this study um, seeks to understand uh, the menstrual cycle and how it relates to demographic lifestyle factors and how um, multiple data streams, including sensor-based technologies, might inform um, our understanding of the menstrual cycle. It is an observational study and longitudinal where individuals um, enroll via their phone. 
And um, the data collection and the platform involves um, both survey um, based data through the app, as well as um, gives the opportunity to contribute other streams of data, um, including um, data that is housed in the health kit, including the data types that you see here. Um, we also have the opportunity to share sensor based data through the watch or the phone. And this facilitates contribution um, to research for individuals as they go about their daily lives. In our initial um, report of the first 10,000 uh, participants to enroll in the study, um, while the phone is not required, sorry, while the watch is not required for participation, 72% of participants did report um, watch use in the cohort. And um, with this, um, I will be transitioning the talk to Lauren Chung to discuss um, the potential with this platform for use of digital sensors. Thank you, Dr. Mahal and Gaia. The Apple Women's Health Study is a great example of how we at Apple are leveraging a variety of Apple's features and tools, which are publicly available to power research. So what you'll see on this next slide is a small sample of the many various signals from Apple devices that can be used in research. Apple Watch and iPhone offer features that span across 17 different areas of health and wellness. Signals from these features, such as heart rate, blood oxygen, wrist temperature, and mobility metrics, just to name a few, can provide information on a wide variety of internal physiologic states. The data from these features is stored securely within the health app, which serves as a repository for both data from Apple devices, and if a user gives permission for third-party Bluetooth connected devices as well. HealthKit then enables research app to connect to this data if the user gives them permission to do so. Sensors on the iPhone and watch can also provide important signals about the external environment, signals like environmental sound levels. Now, I wanna to touch on some of the tools available to researchers to aid in the creation of study apps. Research Kit and Care Kit are open source frameworks that allow researchers to create apps for both medical research and care pilots. They're freely available for anyone to use and include modules that we know can be important to research, including informed consent, survey tools, and active tasks like the trail making test. I do want to touch on privacy for a minute because it's so paramount to everything we do as physicians and researchers. At Apple, we believe privacy is a fundamental human right. That's why all health and fitness data is end-to-end -end encrypted on device when passcode, touch ID, or face ID are enabled. And when stored in the cloud, it's end-to-end -end encrypted in transit to and on our servers. We believe that people should expect the same level of confidentiality from their devices as they do from their doctor. And so we designed all of our features with this principle in mind. Users get to choose exactly what data they share, who they share it with, and can revoke that sharing at any time. And we designed our research tools with that same principle in mind. Because wearables like the Apple Watch and tools like Research Kit and Care Kit can be so powerful in enabling new discoveries, I want to share with you the investigator support program that we created. So this program grants researchers Apple Watches to enable their innovative new studies. We also have clinical and engineering teams available to provide technical feedback and background support as researchers use our open source tools. I do wanna highlight one study kicking off at Texas A&M and Stanford that highlights how signals from the Apple Watch and iPhone can enable research to better understand the effects of the environment on physiology. So the study teams will be providing firefighters in California and Texas with an Apple Watch with the goal of understanding how wildfire smoke impacts heart health. They plan to monitor heart rate and rhythm, sleep, blood auction activity data, and more. And then the firefighters will also wear an air quality monitor and will complete surveys related to sleep, activity, and wildfire smoke-related symptoms. And that's just one of the exciting ways these devices are being used to advance research in this space. Now, I'll pass it back to Dr. Mahal and Gaia to close this out. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Chung. Um, bringing it back to the Apple Women's Health Study, shown here is a snapshot in time um, with the circles representing an individual's age across the reproductive lifespan with the potential for um, time-varying longitudinal exposure assessment in a study like the Apple Women's Health Study, um, with some potential for, for, for both outcome monitoring at the level of the menstrual cycle and exposure assessment at different time windows, such as that related to the menstrual cycle and phases of the cycle, or more um, broad spectrum and longitudinal, for example, at key reproductive transitions or um, even chronically over the lifespan. So um, with that, I um, wanted to thank our participants, our collaborators at the National Institute for Environmental Health Science and our sponsors um, and collaborative team at Apple and for your um, listening. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for your presentation, uh, Dr. Mahalinga, your and Dr. Chang. And uh, we will take all questions during our Q&A session at the end of all the presentation in this session. So next, uh, I will introduce our next speaker, uh, Dr. Jessalyn Dan. Dr. Jessalyn Dan is Assistant Professor of Biomedical Engineering and Biostatistics and Bioinformatics at Duke University. Her work includes multi-omics, wearable sensor, and electronic self-record integration, and digital biomarker discovery. Dr. Dan is the director of the Big Ideas Laboratory, whose goal is to detect, treat, and prevent chronic and acute diseases through digital health innovation. She is also a currently PI of the COVID identity study uh, to detect and monitor COVID-19 using mobile health technologies. Uh, Dr. Dan was an NIH uh, Big Data to Knowledge postdoctoral fellow at Stanford and NSF graduate research fellow at Georgia Tech and Emory, as well as a visiting scholar at the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Pre Prevention and the National Cardiovascular Research Institute in Madrid, Spain. Her research has been internationally recognized with media coverage from the NIH director's blog to Wired, Time, and the US News and World Report. Uh, we'd like to invite Dr. Dan to uh, start our presentation. Um, hi, it's, it's lovely to be here. Thank you so much for the invitation to speak. Um, I want to make sure that you're able to see the full screen. Yes. Okay, fantastic, great. Um, so um, I will be talking today about work that I've been doing with digital biomarker discovery um, on how we can use wearables for early disease detection. So very much in line with the other talks that we've heard so far. Um, I first want to go ahead and define specifically what I mean by a digital biomarker. So a digital biomarker is digitally collected data. So that might be location from a smartphone GPS. It could be continuous heart rate measurements from a smartwatch, continuous temperature measurements, and so on, um, that are transformed into indicators of health outcomes. So these health outcomes could be something like a traditional clinical metric, um, maybe a, an RT-PCR test, for example, of an infection. Um, and essentially what we're doing here is we're mapping information that's coming from digital devices to um, to information that would more traditionally be collected. And so what this looks like, if we want to put this mathematically, is that we have some target outcomes on, on the left-hand side here of the equation. I, I promise this will be the only math in this talk. Um, and what, what we've got here is we're trying to essentially build a prediction algorithm or understand how close we can get to our outcomes of interest using the wearable sensor data that we have. So that could be, you know, any of the metrics that were described in the previous talk um, and um, or more and bringing those together in some way to develop this function. And this function can be anything from, you know, a simple step function to linear or logistic regression all the way up to neural nets. So we can really get creative in what the design is. 
And what I'm going to be talking about today is some of the efforts that we've been doing to actually develop these digital biomarkers in different areas of interest. So we can imagine that on that left-hand side of the equation, our outcomes of interest are traditional clinical or um, contextual measurements of um, infection. So how contagious a person might be if they have an infection or if somebody's not infected, their susceptibility to contracting illness, um, some lifestyle interventions and how we might see their effects. Um, we're very interested in circadian rhythms and circadian disruption. And I'll briefly mention some new work that we're starting on the effects of wildfires, which I think is very relevant to this audience. Um, so I'll talk about three different uh, case studies that are in this space. The first will be on infection detection. The second will be on uh, prediabetes detection. And the third will be the study that we're kicking off on wildfires. So the, the, this work stemmed from uh, work that I had actually begun as a postdoc at Stanford and then continued on as I um, joined Duke, um, where we have these very interesting data sets where people either um, have an infection as a part of sort of natural monitoring in the natural environment, or they have been a part of challenge studies here at the Duke Human Vaccine Institute. Um, and so in either case, what we have is people who have some sort of respiratory infection. Um, in this case, the infections that we've looked at are H3N2, H1N1, human rhinovirus, RSV, and um, COVID-19. Um, and, and we have three different types of measurements that we would have on the left-hand side of that equation. Um, symptoms that might be observable, like number of sneezes or coughs, symptoms that we call unobservable, like pain or nausea, um, and then we have tests that are um, more of a ground truth. And then on the other side, we have wearables. Um, in, in these different studies, we've used different wearables to measure things like heart rate, temperature, accelerometry, and so on. And two of the areas that we're working on developing these um, predictive algorithms in our first distinguishing between whether somebody is infected or not infected. And on the other side, looking at their trajectory of illness. So if somebody is infected, what will that infection look like downstream? And one of the obvious applications here when we think about COVID-19 is if somebody shows up in a hospital and is COVID positive, can we predict whether or not they may end up needing a ventilator or some other um, uh, limited resources. Um, and, and so one of the application areas that we pursued pretty heavily during COVID-19 was an understanding how we could address diagnostic testing shortages at the onset of new pandemics. Um, and so we saw, I'm sure many of us experienced firsthand at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, and even at, at points when there were peaks, um, that it was difficult to get diagnostic tests. Um, and, and the reason for this was because there was so much demand and production was not meeting demand at that time. And so what we wanted to know was, could we use data coming from wearables to better inform how you allocate diagnostic tests when you are in a resource limited setting? And so what we did was we launched the study CoveIdentify in March 2020. So it was really, you know, uh, building the plane while flying it effort, um, as many of us were, were doing at that time. Um, we were able to, because this was a completely remote study, consent about, it was actually about 7,600 people total. Um, and of those, the data that I'm showing here is people who uh, tested negative for COVID and people who tested positive for COVID. And as you can see, um, there are clear signals from the wearable devices where we have changes in these digital biomarkers prior to somebody having a positive COVID test. And so what this indicates to us is that there are some signals that are indicative that somebody is likelier to be infected with COVID. And in this particular application, what we could use that for is to more intelligently allocate uh, tests when we have a limited number of them using this data coming from smartwatches. 
So this is um, one of the, the studies. The other one that I want to briefly present is work that we're doing in cardiometabolic diseases. So the problem that we're trying to address here is uh, another public health challenge that one in three people in the U.S. have prediabetes and 90% of them don't know that they have it. And so what we've been doing is learning from the digital biomarker data whether there are early indicators or even indicators that somebody may be pre-diabetic today that we could leverage to give people more information. So this is just one set of data from this much broader study that actually has a new R01 that's just gotten funded um, that we're excited to continue to pursue this work. Um, but what, what I'm showing here is we have data coming from continuous glucose monitors, which are a slightly invasive device where, you know, you have a, a, a needle that has to be um, sort of entered into the skin. Um, and what we're trying to do here is make predictions on people's glycemic health using A1C as the proxy measurement. This is the American Diabetes Association model showing the root mean squared error and the mean average percent error. The models that we built using the CGM and then using just smartwatch data, no invasive methods whatsoever, are comparable, if not better, than the American Diabetes Association estimated A1C model. So what we can see here from this is that we could use just a smartwatch to have digital biomarkers that are indicative of somebody's A1C level, which is indicative of their glycemic health. What we hope to do with this work is on a much larger scale and deploy a technology like this for the 117 million wearables that currently exist on people's wrists to screen for prediabetes and alert people so that they can get the clinical test, confirm whether or not they have diabetes and start managing their disease. The last application that I'll mention relevant to this group is monitoring cardiovascular effects of wildfires. This is a new study that we're about to bring online where we will have 52 participants either using or not using in-home HEPA filtration and using wearables such that we can measure if there are cardiovascular effects to wildfire instances. Um, the last point, I'm gonna actually skip the summary and I just want to mention that there are a ton of resources here for digital biomarker discovery. So if this is an area of interest to you, I really want to encourage you to check out dbdp.org. Um, there's a bit link here if you're interested in checking out case studies. Essentially what this resource is, is data, code, algorithms, and educational resources to be able to start the process of discovering digital biomarkers. So if you're interested in using this resource or contributing to it, please feel free to contact me or um, just log on to dbdp.org. So with that, I wanna thank the many people who have contributed to this work and we'll be glad to answer questions during the end of the session. Great, uh, thank you Dr. Dan for your wonderful presentation also sharing uh, very useful resources. Uh, next, uh, we will have Dr. David Armstrong. Dr. David G. Armstrong is a professor of surgery with tenure at the University of Southern California. Renowned for his work in tissue repair, wound the healing, and diabetic foot care, he has over 600, uh, 650 peer-reviewed research papers and 100 books or book chapters to his name, and is a founding co-editor of the ADA's Clinical Care of the Diabetic Foot. He co-founded the Southwestern Academic Limb Salvage Alliance and leads USC's NSF-funded Center for Stream Healthcare in place. Here, he, he merges consumer electronic uh, wearables and medical devices to enhance patient care. Dr. Armstrong has received numerous awards by national and international institutions, including the Georgetown Distinguished Award for Diabetic Limb Salvage and the 2023 ISDF's uh, Karel Bakker Award. As the first podiatric surgeon to be named fellow of the Royal College of Surgeons, Glasgow, and the founding president of the American Limb Preservation Society, 
he has made significant strides in his field. Dr. Armstrong is committed to ending preventable amputation within the next generation, a goal that he advances through fostering in innovative interdisciplinary research, clinical practice, and advocacy. Uh, we'd like to invite Dr. Armstrong to begin his presentation. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor Sano, uh, and I hope you uh, can all hear me all right. Uh, if you can't hear me, I would ask you just to relax uh, and take a nap for 10 minutes. How does that sound? Uh, but uh, this has been absolutely spectacular. I mean, one wonderful talk after the next. Uh, but uh, I'm going to try to get you to care about something that you probably haven't thought much about, which is really the end of the body uh, and the foot. And we'll talk about that in a minute. We give all of our slides away. Just please ping me. And we ask you just to copy them and make them better. A lot of the work here is not only from the National Institutes of Health, but also from the NSF and this really awesome, great five, six um, university program called the Center to Stream Healthcare in Place. So, but more on that later. And you heard a little bit about this already yesterday from Bijan uh, Najafi. And you already heard from Dr. Sano what we're going to talk about. You're going to say, well, my gosh, feet, uh, how, what does this have to do with environmental health? But uh, hopefully by the end, you're going to see how a lot of this stuff really can, can come together. Uh, but first, this, uh, you've already, I already told you, this is what I do for a living. I'm, I'm a, I guess you'd say a toe mechanic. And, you know, when you work out at the end of the body, you, I can kind of think of maybe two great gifts there. Uh, one of these gifts is uh, in this era of hubris. You know, I can't think of anything that's more of an expression of humility than looking after someone's feet. It, it's an expression that crosses borders and religions and even time. And the other great gift uh, is uh, that when you work on this anatomic peninsula, uh, instead of at the center of the body, it forces you to collaborate so that we didn't have some perspective with the anatomic mainland. And we're collaborating with folks uh, doing everything from spray on and spread on skin to wearable robots. And it's just such an exciting time to be doing this. And, and, and that's kind of what we're going to be sharing in this area. But first, the perspective bit. And the perspective in diabetes and lower extremity is not a good one. Uh, and right now, uh, foot complications are common, they're complicated, and they're costly. Uh, and they're often ignored. Um, but hopefully, for the next few minutes, we'll talk about this before we talk about some of the solutions. Uh, uh, let's look at some of these data, just putting it into perspective here. Every second now, someone around the world develops a wound on their feet. They wear a hole in their foot, like we wear a hole in a sock. Half of these wounds will get infected, uh, and 20% of those infections end up in hospitalization. And every 20 seconds now, someone around the world has an amputation. And we'd like to think, uh, ladies and gentlemen, that, that time's up for this because this affects people of color uh, much more than, uh, than uh, uh, um, uh, not. And uh, this is a zip code lottery that we see around the country and around the world. And I think we can make a big difference in this area. But first, a little bit more of the bad before we get into the good. It's not fair to compare one terrible thing to another, but look, if we compare this to cancer, uh, after someone gets a wound, uh, you know, 30% of these folks are going to be dead in five years. If they have a minor or major amputation, it's up to 50 and then 60%, even up to 80% with other comorbidities. And then even after healing these wounds, there's a very high rate of recurrence in this population. These folks, just like with cancer, are in remission. So we have a lot of opportunities to affect change in this population. And, and it's really an algorithm, if you will, that's kind of a, uh, it's maybe three parts of the algorithm, but there's really two variables that we can play with surgically, medically, mechanically, technologically. In the face of neuropathy or the loss of protective sensation, people can wear a hole in their foot like they wear a hole in a sock, as I told you. And we can play with pressure. We can play with cycles of activity. Uh, and it's really an imbalance of these things uh, that um, we have to try to bring back into balance. Uh, but before we do that, before we uh, ad address these little wounds that become big wounds, maybe we can measure what we manage a little better. And we haven't done this very well in surgery and medicine. Um, it's been positively medieval up until fairly recently. And there's a lot going on now that's very, very exciting to help us marry a little bit of engineering uh, with a lot of the work that we're doing in the clinic and in the operating room, or if you're British, the operating theater. Uh, but let's first talk about uh, some really cool kind of epidermal electronics and other solutions that may help 
uh, kind of help form a closed loop system. These are data from uh, my friend Wei Gao right down the street at Caltech and where we're working on various kinds of smart managers with them and with uh, the Terasaki Institute. But you also see here, you heard from Christina Davis in that spectacular day yesterday talking uh, about uh, things like looking for volatiles. Well, there are a lot of other things that we can do in addition to volatiles where we can measure uh, uh, infection, we can measure uh, pH change, and we can actually affect change by putting in some therapeutics and creating almost a closed loop system to try to heal these wounds. Um, but before and even as we're healing these wounds, we have to understand that these patients don't have the gift of pain, so we have to be able to protect them. So how do we do that? Well, we have to do something we call offloading, which is kind of a, a physical characteristic, but these folks can't feel anything. So how can we get, can we get them into something that might help them? And we have a really cool uh, uh, um, tool on the study right now where we're working with uh, uh, the National Institutes of Health and the Smart Boot now that actually marries really good design that people will want to wear. This was designed by Mike DiTullo, who designed the second and third generation of Air Jordans. But now this tool uh, can have a gyroscope right on it and actually it can uh, tell our patients when they're wearing it, when they're not, their nurse, their doctor as they like, and maybe instead of doing something to these patients or on them, it could do something with them. And this is such an exciting time because we can help these folks kind of dose their adherence and dose their activity and really be working with them rather than to them. So now after we've healed a wound by offloading it, by monitoring it and measuring it, how do we reduce the risk of recurrence uh, in remission? Well, this again uh, is an engineering tool marrying that uh, with work that we might do uh, uh, in, uh, 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 in the operating room or in the clinic. And we can dose activity just like we dose a drug uh, too high and we get toxicity with a drug, too low, we don't get the benefit of the drug, too high with a patient with diabetes and they'll get a wound, too low and they won't get the cardiometabolic benefit. The trouble with, with this, if we look at this from Dan Lieberman's lab in Boston, we see that the foot is just really beautifully balanced. But with our patients, activity is not balanced. And, uh, and uh, we see here that it's not just the number of steps that folks take, but the actual uh, variability in that activity uh, that we see that can precede ulceration. But we can predict that now and plug it into an entire formula. This is a simple free formula that we can add an AI Sherpa to uh, that can give a patient a high and a low uh, ratio that can really affect positive change. But how can we detect that even further? You know, if you want to sound smart, um, and who doesn't want to sound smart? I'm trying and failing, but there's kind of hope for you. And you're talking about any chronic disease, just say inflammation and walk away and you'll be right. And we can detect inflammation beautifully here uh, in this population, just looking for, looking for asymmetries. Uh, and we can start using uh, thermometry to dose activity, uh, just like we would use, uh, give someone uh, 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 insulin and check uh, by checking their glucose. This can be done through a variety of form factors. Smart socks have been around for quite a while. We've been working with intelligent textiles. But what's really cool now, finally, uh, we're seeing people starting to subscribe to these sorts of beautifully designed things that used to just be a science experiment. And you see people like Rand Ma, who uh, had worked with us some time ago, actually now going to the Consumer Electronics Show and going up against augmented reality and reality reality. Socks seem to be winning in this case. We're working on with Zoltan Pataki here. You see this great work in Geneva on uh, uh, smart shoes and insoles now that can get out of their own way. Um, and, uh, and we are doing the same thing with, uh, with tools. We can maybe even form an AI-based kind of closed loop system uh, in this population. But you know, uh, just in the last minute or two, you know, wearables are really great. It's a whole session here, but they're getting kind of passe. Uh, what about injectables? Uh, now that's kind of cool. And now there are tools uh, and some of them are being worked on by friends and colleagues like Natalie Wisniewski, where we can inject tools and hit them with a laser, just a simple, uh, uh, just a hydrogel, uh, looking at the analytes on that and measuring not only oxygen, but also glucose and many other solutions to affect change in this population. One of the other really cool things are actually entire implantables like smart blood vessels. This is a tool now where you can pair with it on the back table in the operating room, just like you pair with your Bluetooth headset and you can look for turbulent flow. And this can be monitored, not in the clinic. It can be done entirely in the home where we can see a bypass that's about to go down before it goes down. This is a PTFE uh, conduit 
ultimately there'll be other tools that could be very, very helpful here too. But bringing it all together, I think the masters of the universe are gonna be the women and men that can make all of these things communicate, which is why it's so exciting to hear so many brilliant folks uh, at, at this symposium thinking on this. Um, and you're seeing this great work uh, from a company called Foresight Health that has been working with our C2 ship and Marge Skubik and folks who are now working with entire smart homes, looking not only at depth sensors and thermometry, but also motion sensors, watches, having all of those communicate with folks in extended care facilities, allowing them to be mobile and have you know, the hospital, not only hospital free, but activity rich days and even dignity fill days. And really at the end of the day, that's the big idea. So uh, Madam Chair, uh, ladies and gentlemen, you know, often when you treat these patients, you hear, you know, you're just married to them. And that term marriage is used in a negative way, but hopefully um, with a little bit of technology uh, and uh, tenacity and a little humility, we can help these folks move through the world a little bit better with some enhanced perspective. Because I think that's what we all deserve, no matter what our health, no matter what our age. Uh, Madam Chair, everyone, thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure to be here. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Armstrong, for your uh, wonderful future thinking presentation. Next, uh, we will have our last speaker, Dr. Uh, Biena Mishra. Dr. Biena Mishra is a director of the National Science Foundation Nanosystems Engineering Research Center on advanced self-powered of integrated sensors and technologies, ASHIST. While her background and training as an electrical engineer is on advanced high-performance silicon devices, she has spent the last 15 years of her career in integrating these technologies with non-traditional technologies, both in structure and in functionality. She is a distinguished professor of electrical and computer engineering at North Carolina State University and the 2012 IEEE Fellow. She has authors and co-authors over 150 papers in the areas of state-of-the-art low-power devices, nanoscale magnetics, and energy harvesting. Dr. Mishra was the recipient of the 2001 National Science Foundation President Ari Career Award, the 2011 Arokoa Distinguished Engineering Research Award, and 2007 Outstanding Alumni Research Award, and the 2016 R.J. Reynolds Award. Uh, please join me uh, in welcoming Dr. Mishra. Thank you very much, Professor Sano. Um, it is really my great pleasure to share with you all of our work uh, that we have been conducting in the uh, National Science Foundation Assist Center. Uh, this is a, a, a team of multiple universities, multiple disciplines, uh, all working together to build um, wearable systems to, uh, to advance uh, personal health and, and personal environmental health as well. So about 12 years ago, we had this vision of building wearable devices that not only measure health parameters, uh, such as heart rate and motion and um, activity, but also environmental parameters. And uh, to do this, we wanted to achieve a, a few disruptive traits for these wearable devices. We wanted them to be always on so that they would provide us with long-term data. And we wanted them to also, also collect different kinds of data. Uh, we wanted them to be um, uh, wireless and comfortable so they would be passively on. Uh, and we wanted to also uh, uh, in a, be able to uh, provide uh, machine learning and algorithms on the wearable devices itself for real time uh, actionable information. And this formed our mission uh, of the assist center um, that we, uh, like I said, have been working in the last 12 years. Uh, needless to say, uh, there are some key advantages of long term health monitoring. Many of the wearable devices today, they have to be charged regularly. Uh, the more sensors you put on them, the more uh, charging you have to do. Uh, but if there was a way to break out of that equation where you could provide continuous monitoring without the user having to change or charge the battery, uh, then you can really open a, a paradigm in terms of uh, 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 critical positive outcomes. There are many advantages of long-term health monitoring, but in the context of this workshop, uh, there is a huge opportunity to connect health and environmental toxins, 
especially because we are not always uh, aware in advance what environmental toxins we'll be exposed to, uh, whether it's a, a building or a, a, a city or a location. And so having these sensors that are continuously on collecting that environmental data, but not only environmental data, at the same time and in real time, collecting your health data and then using algorithms to correlate the two is the opportunity that's afforded by continuous long-term monitoring. And so we knew uh, immediately that to achieve this, this goal, we had to build devices that were always on. And so our uh, uh, wearables do not rely on a battery charging process. Uh, we were uh, uh, wanting right from the beginning to harvest power from the human body. Uh, use that power in the form of thermal, thermal heat and thermal motion and other sources and make sure we're maximizing the power that was coming out from the body. And then on top of that, we have to make sure that the power that we consumed, whether it was in the sensing, sensing or the computing or the radios to, to do real-time communication was also as small as it could be. And then finally, it had, these devices have to be comfortable and adopted by a variety of individuals. And so wearability and the data that, that comes out of that was also critical. So I will very briefly just show you the kinds of things that we have done uh, to, to keep this equation active. Uh, and then I'll focus most of the talk uh, on, the, uh, on the environmental use case of asthma. Um, and so in order to make sure that our power that we're generating from the human body is as high as possible, uh, we, uh, uh, we have worked on uh, several technologies in the center. Uh, I'm showing a snapshot here. We have built a state-of-the-art flexible thermoelectric uh, generators that take your body heat and convert them to voltage. We have also built a state of the art piezoelectric and flexoelectric materials that take your body motion and convert that to usable power. We are also uh, taking advantage of what's already available, such as ambient RF, and converting that to usable power using uh, uh, antennas that are embroidered into fabrics. And because uh, batteries have a limited amount of recyclability, or charging cycles, we, are also, uh, we also have built supercapacitors. Um, and I'll be happy to share more about this if anybody's interested. On the electronic side, we have really disruptively lowered the power consumed by the various components, whether it's the analog front ends of the chip, whether it's the energy management or the radios. Our work uh, in the last several years have, has really brought this, uh, this consumption down. What that means is, is that, that we have lots of power available to add different kinds of sensors uh, onto our wearables. And in the sensor area, we have been working on integrating uh, your bioelectric sensors, such as your ECG, your EDA, uh, biophotonic sensors, for example, 12 wavelengths of, of optical sensing that allows us to do much more than just PPG. We have inertial sensors. We have a whole host of biochemical sensors that we have built in our center that collect sweat, sweat passively uh, without having to run on the treadmill. Uh, and then also to uh, complete the picture, we have also added environmental sensors, which will be the focus of the rest of my talk. Um, but one more thing before I get into the, to, into the environmental sensors, we also have uh, uh, spent considerable effort in integrating these systems using smart textiles, using novel materials, uh, using um, flexible uh, electronic uh, uh, platforms to really allow a seamless integration and, adapt and adoption by, uh, by the user. So with this approach, we have targeted multiple use cases in our center. Uh, the list is shown on the left here, and, and there's more and more research coming out that many of these use cases actually do have a connection with environmental toxins. Uh, there has been uh, work showing that Alzheimer's is related to environmental exposures, uh, for example, asthma is also related to and, and for uh, sleep as well. So um, um, before I get into asthma, here are the different kinds of uh, uh, wearables that we have built. We would love to uh, partner with uh, anybody who wants to try out these wearables in specific studies. And here uh, you can get all this information um, uh, going on our website, which I'll flash at the end as well. So I want to spend the, the next uh, three and a half minutes in uh, talking about asthma, which was one of our early use cases. And there has been a direct correlation of environmental toxins like ozone uh, with asthma um, and, and also with cardio uh, uh, degradation along with lung, uh, lung degradation. 
and the, the metrics are and the and the numbers are, are in the literature. There are a lot of Americans who live in areas where the ozone levels are, are already not meeting the standards. And we wanted to build a wearable device that would provide continuous monitoring of environmental ozone, environmental volatile organic compounds, along with heart rate, respiration, cough, wheezing, and activity. And because we want these systems to be continuously on, we had to make sure that the power consumption was a, a fraction of what was available out in the commercial space. And so to this point, we built two different technologies of gas sensing. One is based on ultra thin layers of metal oxides using atomic layer deposition. The ultra thin layers allows us to get very, very low power consumption and along with very high sensitivity. And the second technology we built was gravimetric sensing based on MEMS technologies, specifically capacitive micro machine ultrasonic transducers. These two technologies were integrated together to provide different uh, uh, types of uh, transduction mechanisms. And then we were integrate, we integrated these into wearable systems uh, for asthma, which I'll get to in a second. I also wanted to mention that uh, in addition to metal oxides, the gravimetric sensors can be functionalized with different kinds of polymers that can allow us to uh, get different uh, uh, volatile organic compounds and, and not only volatile organic compounds, but specific VOCs that might be connected to different conditions, such as the ones that you see here. And so with, with combining these two technologies, we were able to, and machine learning algorithms, we can identify a variety of different VOCs and variety of different uh, uh, gases that are connected to uh, asthma. And with the asthma platform, we have both a health platform, which is on the chest, and a wrist platform, which is, which is more on the wrist to allow gases to come into this platform. But the wrist platform is also measuring uh, several health parameters, uh, as shown in these uh, bullets here. Uh, we tested this system out in numerous number of uh, clinical uh, studies with our partners at UNC Medical School, and uh, we have got lots of uh, very uh, informative data showing that, in um, uh, first of all, that our, uh, that our wearable ultra-low power gas sensors are actually able to follow the gold standard ozone measurements in the, ch in the chambers that the clinicians use. But on top of that, there are also some new findings that we are uncovering where even in healthy individuals, uh, when they're exposed to very low levels of ozone, we are able to see a decrease in lung function and also a, a degradation of the heart rate variability. You can find the details of this in this publication, but this suggests that uh, if, he if healthy individuals are suffering from very low doses amount of ozone in here, then uh, the uh, respiratory conditions uh, for asthmatic individuals is expected to be a lot more adverse. And uh, we also looked at, uh, at the environmental design, the enclosure design for a system that does both, both health and environmental sensing. And we found that it's essential to design the system to allow airflow in the optimal manner so that we get enough gas gases to the sensing element without compromising the robustness and, uh, and the degradation associated with uh, contaminants. And so some of these details are provided down here. Um, and where we are taking this work next is shown here. We have uh, two types of directions. We are looking at the volatiles coming out of the skin. And so some of the same technologies that I mentioned previously, we're now integrating them into a skin watch and using the same sensors to now look at what's coming out of the skin under different conditions of disease. But our initial pro uh, protocol has used some simple techniques such as clear discern, uh, differentiation in VOCs coming out of the skin under fasting conditions, non-fasting conditions, and for example, alcohol intake. So this is another type of biochemical uh, sensor that's based on gases. And, and finally, we are also building up the number of sensors that we need. Uh, this is using a ENOS array that's compatible with uh, CMOS. Uh, and here we can build up from one or two sensors to 16 sensors and many more, where each sensor is individually addressable in terms of its uh, operating temperature. So this is uh, work uh, being done to uh, further enhance the performance of the gas sensing setup. And uh, we also have uh, two uh, companies that have uh, been coming out of the work that we're doing in this sensing space, shown here. And so I think my time is up. So I'll just say that there's a huge opportunity for uh, combining environmental sensors with wearables. 
Uh, and then these same gas sensing devices can also be used to measure the human volatome. Of course, there are challenges along the way, which makes um, the work even more interesting. So with that, I will stop. Ah, thank you very much for a very, very exciting presentation. Now uh, we will be starting our Q&A session. Uh, so uh, please, everyone, uh, please uh, feel free to post your question uh, using the Q&A function below the video player online. So we'd like to ask uh, the question uh, to Dr. Mahalinga and Dr. Chen. Uh, in the Apple uh, women's study, uh, what air quality related health endpoints were measured? How is the performance of wearable uh, air quality sensors compared to fixed on site air quality sensors? Thank you for that question. We have not yet um, started measuring air quality in relation to um, participants in the Apple women's health study, but that is um, an area of interest. Mm -hmm. Then uh, next question is uh, to Dr. Dan. Uh, yep. uh, which types of wearable sensors data are utilized for comprehending COVID infection? Additionally, uh, what kind of wearables has been employed for this purpose? Thanks for this great question. Um, what we used in, in our study was really consumer wearables, so measurements of heart rate, movement, and sleep. Um, we can imagine that as we can get to higher resolution data and more types of sensors, we can have higher resolution picture of perhaps what type of infection somebody might have, and that's one of the directions that we're going next. Thank you. Uh, a question to uh, Dr. Armstrong. Uh, what types of future closed loop systems do you foresee for food wound? Uh, which treatment could be delivered in variable control, control doses at variable times, like insulin is delivered for elevated glucose concentrations? Yeah, a wonderful question. Um, the If we have um, so our goal really for kind of tissue repair, but also for preventing these things is, is to try to identify problems and then, and then deliver them. We think that using, um, uh, looking for various analytes like metalloproteases and then hitting them with an anti-metalloprotease could be a valuable um, option. We think we could be delivering even mechanical things, believe it or not, like, like electrical stimulation uh, through some of these tools, which actually has some data. Uh, to support it, uh, 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 even topical oxygen now is showing surprising benefits. So things that could be inexpensive and delivered locally could be helpful. On the prevention uh, side of things, uh, it's equally exciting. And of course, there we're seeing these problems rising logarithmically. So there's even more of an opportunity and identifying um, inflammation uh, through thermometry and dosing the activity in that fashion with a high and a low, uh, again, just like people dose their insulin by checking their glucose, uh, could, and, and having some of these tools that could actually get out of their own way, like some of these shape memory alloys, uh, or even just physical systems, might be really, really helpful um, in this population. I think there are women and men working on these sorts of things right now, but there's a lot of brain power uh, that is still uh, needed uh, in this area. And it's, it's, these problems are getting more common, not less. So there's a lot of work to be done. Oh, thank you very much for your answer. Uh, the next question is going to Dr. Mishra. Uh, apart from ozone, uh, which are other individual common environmental VOCs that can be measured by your sensors? Are these sensors for binyl fluoride? Uh, like other chemicals, or are these sensors for benzene, uh, naphthalene, and other petroleum-related chemicals? Uh, yes, we have uh, built uh, sensors that can measure a lot more uh, volatile organic compounds than, than just ozone. Uh, we have specific sensors for uh, ethanol, toluene, um, xylene, um, hexanol, um, octanol, and so on and so forth, along with formaldehyde um, and uh, acetone. 
and so forth. But also there's an opportunity that as we increase more uh, the number of sensors in a given array to a larger and larger number, we can, we can now start measuring almost uh, anything provided we have the right uh, machine learning algorithms in place, uh, trained algorithms in place uh, that we can then use to infer what is in the mixture. So if you want specific sensors, we need specific materials to bind to them. But if you want to know what's in the mixture, we can do a lot with uh, ENOS and machine learning. Yeah, thank you. So the next questions will be uh, to everyone. Uh, so what are the, the key challenges and opportunities you see in the current application of wearable technologies for environmental health and biomedical research? And how do you think they can be addressed or leveraged for better outcomes? Uh, anyone? I can jump in and I would say that on our end, one of the big challenges is the, the battery life issue. And so it's super exciting to hear the work going on at the assist center, because um, when we talk about adherence to device wear, one of the big challenges is that people take devices off to charge them, forget to put them back on. Um, and so the longer we can have devices on the body where people don't need to remove them, um, the better we will get with adherence, the better data we'll get, the better predictive algorithms we can build. Um, so it's thrilling to hear what's going on at Assist. I'll be very, very brief. By the way, not only with, with what Assist is doing, which is next level, but also even, uh, you know, wireless-based charging, I mean, uh, you know, through the wall charging, even using very, very weak signals like Wi-Fi for things is super exciting on the power end. But I think one of the big challenges um, is interoperability. And, and you know, I think um, it, it's exciting that we have Apple here. Uh, and it was just a spectacular talk from uh, from uh, uh, from both Shruti and, and Vina. And I really look forward to seeing uh, what Dr. Chung have to deliver in the future. But having kind of platform agnostic technologies that could talk to one another and then delivering things to um, whether it is uh, um, someone about toxicities on the environmental side or to a clinician or to a patient or a per just a person at home uh, that is actionable is really uh, what is next level to really avoid kind of a paralysis of analysis. Because if we can do that with all this stuff flooding into us now, uh, those are the masters of the universe that are going to make a, the biggest difference in the future. Uh, anyone have any final comment to the question? Uh, I would just add that in, in environmental sensing specifically, there are perhaps additional challenges, uh, just making sure that that environmental sample is getting to your device um, and the surface is not getting contaminated over time, which is not just for wearables, it's for all environmental contact-based sensing, but that is a challenge um, that will need to be overcome, especially if you want to do long-term monitoring. I'll just add one other aspect of um, timing the exposure to the relevant time window for the biological outcome, I think is really important. Maybe not a stumbling block, I think it's um, achievable, but with all of these advances, it seems like there might be potential to really hone in on key um, time windows, and that's really exciting. What I'll add is I, I think there is a really interesting opportunity here highlighted by all the talks that we've heard today, and it sounds like yesterday, about the move from population health to personalized health, right? So taking all of that data that, that we are generating from individuals where they are within their life and being able to use that data, hopefully in a way that preserves a user's privacy, that really helps us understand a little bit more about what is needed for a specific individual and helps individuals themselves understand their baseline and what is and isn't normal for them, both within and outside of the environment they're in. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you everyone for uh, wonderful presentations and also Q and sessions. So we will be concluding this session and uh, we will be now moving on to the next session, uh, panel discussion moderated by Dr. Jennifer Horney and the Trey Thomas. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Is everyone able to hear me? 
or any anyone? Great. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so my name is Jennifer Horney. I'm a professor of epidemiology and a core faculty member in the Disaster Research Center at the University of Delaware. And I want to welcome you all to session four on understanding how technology adoption, implementation, and science communication factor in advancing biomedical and environmental health research. So I'm really excited to hear from our panelists. I don't know if we can top the last one, but we will try. Um, so we will hear um, from five speakers as part of this. Um, so I will um, it, briefly introduce uh, them now. So um, our first speaker will be Nita Farahani from Duke Law. Um, next, we will hear from uh, Dr. Chattervedi, um, who is uh, from the University of Southern California. And then we will hear from uh, Dr. Ban Sali, uh, who is a distinguished professor at Florida International. So I would just like to remind everyone that there will be, like in the past session, an all panelist Q&A session. So please submit your questions through the Slido during the presentations. Um, and so I will, without further ado, introduce our first speaker on this panel, uh, Nita. Uh, she is a leading scholar on the ethical, legal, and social implications of emerging technologies, as well as the Robinson Everett Distinguished Professor of Law and Philosophy at Duke Law School, and the founding director of Duke Science and Society, and faculty chair of the Duke Masters in Arts in Biomedical and Science Policy. Her current scholarship focuses on the implications of emerging neuroscience, genomics, and artificial intelligence for law and society, and legal and ethical issues arising from the COVID-19 pandemic. She is also working on FDA law and policy and the use of science and technology in criminal law. In addition to legal and scientific publications, uh, she is also the author of the book, The Battle for Your Brain, Defending Your Right to Think Freely in the Age of Neurotechnology. In 2010, she was appointed by President Obama to the Presidential Commission for the Study of Bioethical Issues. She received an AB in Genetics, Cell, and Developmental Biology from Dartmouth, an ALM in Biology from Harvard, and a JD and MA from Duke, as well as a PhD in Philosophy. Um, and I actually heard her speak on uh, NPR, so I'm very excited and would like to invite her to present her, begin her presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer, and thanks for having me. Um, I don't know if I can top the NPR episode. I suspect that one was edited, but you know, <laughs> I'll do my best. Um, so I'm going to focus specifically on the area that I know the most about, which is looking at brain wearables. Um, or wearables and the brain more generally and kind of the coming age of using sensors and everyday technology and what the implications are for thinking about privacy and what kinds of rules we need to put into place and what kinds of oversight we need to put into place and empowerment of individuals we need to put into place to really realize the benefit of this coming um, new area of uh, sensors. So um, right now, there are, and let me just make sure, are you seeing the slideshow version? Okay, good. Um, so uh, right now, there are some tremendous investments that are underway, um, both by neurotech companies, but also by large uh, tech or the, the kind of big five into embedding brain sensors into everyday technology. Um, and up until now, most uh, consumer wearables for neurotechnology have been quite limited both in terms of the form factor, because um, they're uncomfortable headbands that are unlikely to be worn by most people as they go about their everyday lives. And they've been quite limited in application to um, things like meditation or improving focus. So they've really been niche products with limited applications. But as companies from Meta to Snap, Microsoft, and even Apple secure patents, acquire companies, um, and start to look at embedding brain sensors into everyday technologies. And as the technology um, improves to enable 
uh, EEG sensors to be put into two ears with better powered algorithms that can filter out more and more noise to get better signal to noise ratio to um, improve what those signals uh, can be interpreted and mean, um, the possibilities become much more significant. Um, just today, I saw another company who launched a product that is uh, purportedly um, a neural interface device that I'll talk about in a moment. But the idea is, this is really, I believe, the kind of final frontier of, of sensors, which is to bring sensors to the brain and not just to the wrist for picking up heart rate or to the fingers for picking up sleep and other activity or EMG sensors that are picking up um, bioelectric potentials throughout the body. And the promise of doing so, I think, is extraordinary. That is, um, the toll of neurological disease and suffering in society continues to rise, even as physical health and longevity continue to improve. Um, the um, implications for individuals to have so little insights into their own brain activity, um, objective insights into their own brain activity, given the other objective data that they have access to, um, I think in many ways holds us back. And the possibilities of wide-scale use of brain sensors in everyday lives um, creates the possibilities of creating large-scale data sets of individuals engaged in everyday activities so that we just might one day be able to address the leading causes of neurological disease and suffering and even be able to get a better handle on our stress, um, have better interventions for things like ADHD, improve our focus in an increasingly distracted world, um, and even find the things that theoretically engage our brains the best rather than the things that potentially diminish and um, make our lives actually net worse. But one of the things that's interesting um, among the many is that these brain sensors are being looked at not just for increasing the transparency of the brain and making it more accessible to individuals, but also potentially as serving as an interface to other technology, which is different in kind than um, existing sensors and opens up the possibility of much more ubiquitous use of that technology. It also um, opens up the possibility that it will become deeply integrated into our everyday lives. And while it's still early days at really achieving neural interface, as I mentioned, I saw a company just today that announced um, a wristband uh, that purportedly is neural interface that can be attached to an Apple Watch so that people can do things like interact with the rest of their technology while having, uh, I, I thought initially looking at their advertisements that was EMG, it looks like bioelectric potentials that could be used to try to do things like interface with other technology. One of the complications of this space, of course, is the fact that by most, by now, most people realize um, that free services or that services that are provided by big tech company comes at the expense of individuals' personal data and privacy. While Google originally sought to bring order to the web and provide high quality search results, it now commands 92% of the search market. That may change with um, the advent of chatbots and LLMs. Um, but tech companies' business models have been resting upon the ability to sell their understanding of us to others. Um, Google does this through real-time uh, bidding process, which provides advertisers with opportunities to uniquely target advertisements in real estate. Meta does much the same thing, harvesting data on billions of users and creating psychological profiles um, of them that advertisers can use to micro-target their pitches. And Shoshana Zuboff coined this term surveillance capitalism to describe this now ubiquitous phenomenon characterizes data about behaviors of bodies, minds, and things and surveillance assets that can be used for purposes of knowing, controlling, and modifying behavior to produce new varieties of commodification, monetization, and control. And I would argue that our brains are truly our last fortress of privacy, that they are the kind of one space in which there is some at least unexpressed emotions, unexpressed thoughts, unexpressed words and images that can't be easily detected through other kinds of inferences. And while again, it's early days still, and most people would argue that the kinds of data that you can gather from so many other aspects of our lives are gonna be more um, important than the data you gain from the brain, um, that will change over time. And the ways in which it's already being misused in employment contexts by authoritarian regimes who are requiring or forcing the use of brain sensors, who are using it to 
threaten, to coerce, um, requiring students to wear brain sensors in the classroom to track their attention and focus, this can have a profoundly chilling effect um, in ways that can undermine rather than empower individuals. Nevertheless, I strongly believe that we have to get to a place where there is the possibility of sharing data. Um, and the only way we do so is by creating a system by which people can be confident that the use of these sensors are empowering to them rather than disempowering, which means we need to put into place, I believe, a right to cognitive liberty. And that right to cognitive liberty, I think, is both a human right, which protects people's right to self-determination, to access and use such wearables, but a right to mental privacy and freedom of thought, which means that the default of brain wearables shouldn't be the same as social media platforms, but treated as more sensitive data. That multifunctional devices should have greater user control. If you're using your earbuds to listen to music, there should be times at which you can turn off or disable features of things like brain activity tracking. And we need to determine how to put safeguards into place for individual and group harms that can arise from the sharing of this data to enable people to confidently use brain sensors and to safeguard themselves against the potentially deeply intrusive privacy risks that can arise as a result. Thanks, and I look forward to the conversation. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Farahani, and hopefully I am pronouncing names correctly. Um, our next speaker is Ratika Chattervedi. Uh, Dr. Chattervedi is a biomedical engineer at the USC Schaefer Center for Health Policy and Economics. Um, she has a diverse background in engineering, science and technology policy, asset valuation, strategic consulting, and translational biomedical research. The research involves improving fairness and equity and precision digital health. She currently leads the American Life in Real Time study, which involves Fitbit collection from a large representative sample of participants, established using FAIR standards, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Um, ALIR serves as a benchmark cohort and data set for the digital health community to improve transparency and validity in digital health model development. So we'd like to invite Dr. Chattervedi to begin her presentation. Uh, thanks so much for the introduction and for having me here. I'm thrilled to introduce our American Life in Real Time study to this group. Um, as it was mentioned, uh, ALIR was designed as a benchmark data set uh, for equity in digital health, and it's an interdisciplinary partnership spanning health policy, economics, engineering, and computer science across USC and our partners at Evidation Health. So we've talked a lot at this meeting about the benefits of wearables and digital health and how we can create personalized health interventions using large scale data and advanced analytics. So I won't go into too much detail about that here. But what I wanted to focus on today is that one of the benefits that's often cited in this work is that machine learning and big data have the potential to reduce both explicit and implicit biases in life science research and medical decision making. And what I wanted to emphasize is that there are reasons to be very skeptical of this claim. Uh, so this is what the digital health framework should look like in theory, but in reality, it looks a little different. And it turns out that there are field-wide methodological biases that systematically underrepresent minoritized populations. First, most studies rely on convenient samples of easy to reach populations and bring your own device designs. This creates selection biases in the data from which these algorithms are trained. Second, advanced analytic approaches often rely on the use of complete cases where data with a lot of missingness are eliminated from the analyses. However, we know that device use and competency is strongly associated with socioeconomic status. So this creates a one-two punch. You have a non-representative population that becomes even less representative during the analysis phase. So how bad is this problem? If you look at the Understanding America study, or UAS, which is a probability sample of US, of US adults, only about 22% of the sample are self-motivated device owners, which is in line with estimates from others such as Pew. But what I want to emphasize is that the sociodemographic distribution of these individuals differs significantly from the US population. Uh, here you have the general population in black, the US, uh, UAS sample in white, and self-motivated device owners in green. And you can see that owners are significantly more female, more white, more educated, and with higher incomes. 
Consequently, excluding non-owners from digital health studies results in demographic and socioeconomic disparities across almost all factors. And these demographic distributions even dis differ based on the type of wearable. Here, Apple Watch owners skew even younger, more educated, more likely to be working, and with higher incomes. Now, this is important because most studies will choose a device uh, to be able to compare across people. So what is the gap in the field? It really is that benchmark data sets are urgently needed for the digital health community to test, train, and validate AI and ML models in an uh, equitable and rigorous manner. And there are a couple important concepts here. So first, benchmark data sets are used to establish performance criteria for software tools uh, and afford more transparency in a field that inherently deals with algorithmic black boxes. Second, FAIR standards, which st stand for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, is an emerging standard in computer science to improve the democratization of big data analytics. By combining these principles, we came up with a list of design criteria for benchmark, for a benchmark PGHD data set. First, we wanted to ensure sociodemographic representation and came up with four criteria, national probability sampling with a focus on inclusive representation of marginalized populations, hardware provisioning, um, encompassing both internet, uh, mobile devices and wearables. And then second, we wanted to ensure rigorous labeling, which allows for machines to learn patterns in the data. So long-term longitudinal data collection to capture temporal patterns and well-validated measures through surveys, which allows for low-cost repeated collection when compared to clinical or biomarker endpoints. If you look at existing studies in this space, there are only a handful of studies that meet the FAIR criteria, namely NHANES, the UK Biobank, all of us, and the Framingham Heart Study. And they fulfill the benchmarking criteria to varying degrees, but none of them really hits all of the criteria. And this is where the American life in real time comes in. In partnership with the Understanding America study, we aim to achieve both sociodemographic representation and high quality labeling. So how did we design this? So first we enrolled a random sample of about a thousand adults from the Understanding America study, which again uses address-based probability sampling to recruit its cohort. Uh, participants who did not have internet are provided with a tablet with 4G connection. We provide everybody with a Fitbit device as an incentive, regardless of whether or not they already have a device. Uh, participants contribute periodic surveys through their involvement in both UAS and ALIR. And we also match contextual data, both temporally and geospatially. Uh, the infrastructure is flexible enough to accommodate future data streams from literally anything with an API, including electronic health records, genomics, biomarkers, apps, and even medical devices. And we follow these participants for as long as they're willing to contribute the data, but at least for one year. So let's look at the cohort itself. So our main question here was, through our methods, were we actually able to achieve sociodemographic representation? And the short answer is yes. Here you have population benchmarks uh, in black and the unweighted allele sample in green. And we find that our unweighted data set is largely representative across SES characteristics. Now, when you compare this again to self-motivated device owners in orange here, you can see how stark the differences can be. Um, we only balanced our invitations on socioeconomic factors such as sex, race, age, and education, but in recruiting a representative population based on SES alone, we were pleased to find that we also achieved a largely representative sample in terms of health characteristics as well. And again, if you compare this to self-motivated device owners, you see that they're much more likely to be significantly healthier than the general population. So next, let's talk about what's actually in the data set. And just to give you a sense of the multi-level nature of the data, uh, the light green boxes here represent the biannual data, data that we have for these participants, including the full health and retirement survey instrument, which goes back to uh, 2014 for some participants. The light blue boxes are the monthly longitudinal surveys we added specifically for this study, primarily in the social, structural, and environmental determinants of health um, and health measures that are likely to change month to month, like physical and mental health. The dark green boxes are derived measures uh, from the minute level sensor data from the Fitbit API. And finally, the dark blue boxes are contextual data from public data sets, such as pollution, crime, weather, that we match both geospatially and temporally to participant timelines. 
So finally, let's talk about why this matters. And I'll give you a very quick example with COVID-19. Uh, we found that there are significant changes in Fitbit biometrics from individual specific baselines during COVID infection. And this figure shows uh, the change in heart rate, but we say changes in activity, sleep, walking speed, and several other important Fitbit measures. If you throw all these data into a machine learning model, we find that we can predict COVID onset and disease with pretty high accuracy. But let's look at how sociodemographics influence model performance and bias. On the left, you have a model trained on a representative sample from Elier. On the right, you have a model trained on just self-motivated device owners from the UAS cohort. On face value, the performance for both of these models is more or less the same, with an area under the curve of 0.85 on the left and 0.83 on the right. However, when you test these models on out-of-sample individuals, you see that the BYOD model does not perform as well as the Elier model in underrepresented groups. Here we're showing performance in males as our BYOD cohort heavily skews female, and you can see that the performance drops substantially on the right. And you can see similar trends in non-white groups and lower educated groups. So collectively, this demonstrates the need for representative sampling for equitable model performance in AI and machine learning. And so this brings me to the end of my thought talk. I'd like to thank our growing team of supporters across multiple universities and our sponsors at the NIH. And thank you so much for having me here. Thank you. I think we, we definitely could have uh, had our whole session talking about the interesting findings in those uh, research, those curves that you showed at the end. Um, so I hope that everyone is um, thinking and, and submitting their questions. Um, so our next speaker is uh, Dr. Ban Sali from uh, Lucent Technologies. Um, the Distinguished University Professor at, is a Lucent Technologies Distinguished University Professor at the Florida International University. Um, and was previously the director of the US National Science Foundation Division of Electrical Communications and Cyber Systems for two years. Uh, Dr. Bonsali's exper expertise is in the field of biosensors, microfluidics, nanostructured catalysts, and microsystems. And he also has a background in developing uh, micro microfluidic tools for DNA damage de detection, 3D multicellular spheroid monitoring, real time biomarker monitoring, automated cell health, uh, cardiovascular diagnostic sensors, and many other diagnostic devices. He's been recognized uh, for mentoring through multiple awards, including the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation Mentor of the Year, and is an active member of the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers and a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science and the National Academy of Inventors. We would like to invite Dr. Von Sully to begin his presentation. All right. So I'm hoping you can hear me. Yes. Excellent. All right. Okay. So let me go back. So what, what I was talking about, and it's fantastic talks, right? So I was trying to switch gears and look at both technology and uh, the workforce that drives our work, right? Uh, so like I said, we we started as my career doing MEMS devices and making this really cool stuff and lab on a chip things, and then eventually transitioned into wearables. So what I'm showing you here is one of those uh, wearable wound sensors for diabetic foot wounds that we did in collaboration with the Veena as part of the assist uh, center. Uh, you heard from Veena earlier. Uh, and this was basically us monitoring uh, uh, a couple of analytes there, right? Um, and, and then uh, we did the same thing. Uh, cortisol is an example that was talked about yesterday. Uh, we did the basic test, but then uh, developed the basic technology for point of care use, point of use. Uh, and this was used both for looking at farm workers and their toxicity exposure with one colleague and depression in pregnant women with another colleague, right? So the same biomarker, depending on the circumstance, correlated to clinical. So, uh, but if you take a step back and we look at what we really are trying to do uh, at the intersection of disciplines, and this is like more electrical engineering forum and I have to have a Mickey Mouse, I'm from Florida, right? So. Uh, but if you take a sensor, stick it to the body, uh, anybody working on it needs to have a good handle on multiple domains. And I'm just listing some out, and I'm sure I've missed many, right? Uh, 
and at least an awareness of many others. Uh, so if you're trying to do this, how do you accomplish this, uh, especially in undergraduate and graduate curriculum? So, so the one thing that I wanted to share with you is something that when I, when I was at USF, we started uh, was this whole idea of interdisciplinary training when it was still very nascent and NSF had just started IGERS, right? So uh, between USF and FIU, uh, the institution spent about $2 million total uh, of the institutional cash. And we started our programs um, at intersection of way there was disciplines. The first one at uh, USF was doing marine science and engineering, right? And the critical part on trying to get the ideas going back and forth was actually co-locating students and, and making them just sit in the same shared space. And that seemed to work, right? So over the last 20 years, and this is just program that I'm involved with, uh, we went from that initial two new million dollar investment in two institutions to over 200 minority students getting funded so far. And you know, collateral to that is things like the ERCs, which if I use part of three, I'm part of the partner with Arena, uh, and that we don't even count those research grants, right? So institutionally, I think there's a huge ROI uh, as uh, investments are made. But if we take a step back and, and look at a curriculum structure, because um, I don't know how, how many of us really carefully follow what's happening in academia and where the trends are, um, but 10 or 15 years down the road, uh, our supply line is not gonna look anything close to what we have right now. Our undergraduate curriculum is 120 courses, 60 credits of gen ed, 60 credits of upper division, very traditional. So how do you get the depth that they need and the, the breadth we need for these kind of works? So something that, that we've played around with at uh, uh, FIU when I was the department chair was we just changed our curriculum. Uh, we went from six electives in undergrad to 32 electives, uh, credits, you know, track-based curriculum, opening up a graduate curriculum, um, and then have specialized degrees, you know, which are kind of going in, in depth in the, in the same field. Uh, but increasingly looking at uh, immersive learning experiences. I mean, we have a very thriving undergraduate research experience program during the year and uh, with the very broad participation of students, right? Uh, and, and I think that's one way that this will work. The other challenge that I think I see uh, for a lot of work we do is, I, I just, just Googling up what are the you know, last 10, 15 years, what are the coolest things that happened? Uh, 2021 is a star because that's just my world. I mean, for those of you who don't know the gallery test, this is a blood test that was, I think, developed by a company that screens you for 50 cancers um, with pretty high accuracy. But if you look at it, a lot of the stuff that we do uh, underlines, in terms of technology, underlines the products that are being uh, that we are looking at. But it doesn't translate into excitement, um, bringing back uh, students to basic sciences. So it's it's the BSA, BSF code, right? How do you make sure students understand that the we we are behind every product that's being made out there, right? Uh, and and that becomes that I think is a challenge for us uh, and continue to be a challenge in how we get the workforce in the pipeline uh, to do the kind of work that we want done. This is where we are. I mean, if you look at the hype curve. Uh, Everything we are talking about doesn't make it to the hype curve. So uh, given conversations and interests are driven by social media, how do we you know, get popular? So I, I wish I had answers. I'm just kind of leaving open questions as to how do we attract the best talent uh, into our areas? And, and that remains a challenge uh, that we increasingly wrestle with. So, you know, coming to the end of my time, so I'll stop here uh, thanking my group uh, and my sponsors, uh, uh, both current and former. Um, and with that, I'll pass the mic back. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bansali. I now have the honor of turning the rest of the session over to my co-moderator, Trey Thomas. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Trey Thomas. Uh, I'm with the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission, and it's my pleasure to serve as the moderator for panel two, uh, for the panel two presentations. Uh, 
unfortunately, we had uh, one of our panelists had an emergency, uh, but we will continue on to hear from uh, Dr. Tiffany Powell Wiley and Deborah Prince uh, in these last two presentations. So I will go ahead and begin to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Tiffany Powell Wiley. Uh, she is an Earl Statman investigator and in chief of the social determinants of the obesity and cardiovascular risk laboratory at the National Institutes of Health. Uh, she has a joint appointment in the cardiovascular branch of the Division of Intramural Research at the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute and the Intramural Research Program at the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities. Dr. Powell Wiley's interdisciplinary team uses community-engaged research, epidemiologic methods, and translational approaches to better understand social factors that promote obesity and limit cardiovascular health. In 2023, Dr. Powell Wiley was chosen for the American Society for Clinical Investigation, and Dr. Uh, Paul Wally graduated civil cum laude with a degree in engineering from the University of Michigan uh, and has an MD from Duke uh, University School of Medicine. So with that, we'd like to invite Dr. Paul Wiley to begin your presentation. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Thomas, and thank you to the organizers for the opportunity to be here today. Um, today, I'll be talking about um, using digital health technology and community engagement and how we're using uh, digital health technology to promote uh, cardiovascular health equity. So these are my disclosures. Um, in terms of the promise that we know uh, relates to the use of digital health technology, particularly in addressing cardiovascular disease um, uh, uh, disparities and in cardiovascular disease prevention, we know that we can think of uh, the use of technology really across the spectrum of prevention. And that can be from primordial to secondary prevention, where we can use things such as telemonitoring, text messaging, mobile apps, all of which can play a role in really tailoring information and tools for users, particularly those patients who have limited access to healthcare. And we also need to um, think about wearables and how those um, can be used along with many of the sensors that have been mentioned as a part of this meeting in not only measuring environmental exposures, but also psychosocial and um, stress-related factors um, experienced by those populations that are most impacted by health disparities. And so in thinking about utilizing those tools, we also need to consider potential barriers um, that exist, um, whether it may be cultural uh, barriers related to trust in the healthcare system and providers that um, promote the use of those tools, concerns about um, uh, privacy and, uh, of, and safety of health information, but also concerns about potential discrimination based on data that um, is collected and all of that limits or impacts the willingness of individuals and patients to use uh, digital health technology. And so we've put forward that community engagement is really key in thinking about how do we build the partnerships um, with community um, populations, again, most impacted by health disparities, to really um, gain feedback through the process of developing interventions. And so we, um, I put forward in a recent perspective and circulation of how we really need to center patient voices in the development of interventions more broadly in cardiovascular research, but we can think of this, the paradigm that it, and the processes that are involved in community engagement and really developing um, interventions that not only um, help in improving cardiovascular health, but also in addressing social determinants that impact cardiovascular health. And so if we're going to develop interventions that um, utilize digital health technology and engage um, communities, we need to make sure that these interventions are um, accessible to all and really think about um, providing uh, wearables and devices as a part of interventions, but also think about making sure that um, these studies are um, built on the trust within the community, that they are um, they're built in a sustainable manner, but also that they 
uh, utilize and recognize that all communities have assets that can be leveraged to improve uh, health. And again, um, many of the digital health tools that have been mentioned here, but um, can be utilized in promoting and um, a better understanding cardiovascular health can also be used to, to understand the role of social determinants, particularly environmental and psychosocial stressors that um, impact uh, cardiovascular risk. And so in um, the work that we've done in Washington, D.C. and building partnerships um, at, with um, my group at NIH, but also groups at local universities, including Howard University, as well as um, community-based uh, organizations that do work around um, improving cardiovascular um, health. We've also brought to the table community members as a part of a community advisory board called the uh, Washington DC Cardiovascular Health and Obesity Collaborative, or DC Chalk, to work in developing um, and providing feedback on um, each step of the process for the development of intervention. And the culminating um, intervention that we are currently implementing from working with this advisory board is called the Step It Up uh, Physical Activity Intervention. And so this uh, community advisory board uh, building partners from all of these institutions uh, locally has met uh, quarterly for almost the past 10 years to provide feedback on each step of the process in developing um, the work that we do. And so they not only provided feedback on the design of the mobile apps that we're using as a part of our intervention, but they helped to help us understand how these apps could even be utilized um, for measuring cardiovascular health um, in the community. And we also have worked to really um, work within the community to understand how we can disseminate the findings from the, the study so that what we are learning gets directly um, passed back to the community so that we can further tailor um, future interventions or that we can work with community and academic partners to develop uh, uh, more um, detailed uh, focused interventions based on what we're learning about cardiovascular health. And many of the um, tools that we've used have been really, have been designed using a user-centered design process where we've worked with community members to do user experience testing for each of our uh, the digital tools that um, we're using um, in the um, as a part of the intervention. And so just to take a step back and to show kind of where things started, we started by really recognizing uh, the disparities in cardiovascular health and, and really looking at where uh, risk uh, for cardiovascular disease was most prevalent in the city. And we targeted those areas in Southeast and Northeast DC where we knew obesity was most prevalent, but we also knew that cardiovascular disease um, was highest in these communities. These were areas most impacted by uh, disinvestment and segregation. And so we focused on doing co data collection at community sites to not only understand what cardiovascular health looked like in the communities, but also to uh, look at utilization of tools for measuring and, and, and monitoring cardiovascular health using wearables as well as mobile apps um, within the population. We identified physical activity as a particular target for intervention, particularly among African-American women in the population. And we were one of the first studies to show how wearable uh, physical activity monitors could be used um, in the population we were working with, um, with high, uh, who are at high risk for cardiovascular disease. And so it allowed us to show the feasibility of using wearable devices um, within the community for future intervention and really set the stage for the design of the Step It Up um, intervention, which is a sequential multiple assignment randomized trial or SMART uh, study that uses uh, mobile health technology to promote physical activity for African-American women living in our target areas of Washington, DC and surrounding areas of Maryland. And so this is a uh, intervention that's built on a uh, multi-level framework 
Um, it's designed to use uh, digital technology to test whether messaging that's um, been developed can change per individuals' perceptions about resources for physical activity within their environment and whether that improves physical activity over and above standard messaging. And we've developed this um, intervention over a phased approach where um, we have a, a first phase where we designed the metrics for the study. The second phase was extensive pilot testing. And right now we're in our efficacy trial where we're implementing the randomized trial. And this was built on the orbit uh, model for designing behavioral interventions. And so just to give you a sense of what the, uh, how the messaging works for the intervention, again, it's built on a multi-level framework and we adapted the socio-ecological model to de develop messaging for the intervention. And so we have messaging that works at the individual level that is more focused on um, getting individuals to um, feel, uh, gain social support and feel, um, set goals for physical activity and work to maintain those goals as a part of the intervention. And this was developed in collaboration with investigators at GW. Um, and then the second type of messaging is more built on the, uh, to work at the neighborhood level, it's called location-based messaging. And this is designed to work by using geofences to provide messaging about physical activity resources um, when a participant is near within a certain distance of those resources. And so we worked with community members to identify community assets for physical activity that um, we might not uh, necessarily see on maps or websites. And so as we design this, um, test these uh, tools and this messaging as a part of the mobile app for the intervention, we tested um, each uh, version of the app using um, both uh, qualitative and quantitative methods um, to test the use of the app as well as barriers and facilitators to app usage. And we um, incorporated suggestions for improving the app into the next design. And then um, we uh, tested both the standard messaging as well as the location-based messaging through pilot testing. And now we're, uh, as I said, implementing the full uh, six-month physical activity intervention. And so this um, is just one example of how community-engaged research can really be used um, to develop these digital health interventions that are tailored to those populations that are most impacted by health disparities. And really, we can think of um, the important role of digital health technology in addressing social determinants that influence not only cardiovascular disparities, but really chronic disease disparities. And ultimately, by incorporating this type of data um, into um, these uh, into community engaged approaches, we can um, not only uh, develop more equitable interventions, but also, as um, was mentioned previously, more equitable algorithms for our uh, the work that we do. So I'd like to acknowledge um, my uh, partners and collaborators and those who've worked with me on this uh, work, especially our um, community advisory board uh, members, and I'm happy um, to take questions um, at the end of the session. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, Powell Wiley. That was an excellent presentation and really glad to see the application uh, of the wearable technology. So thank you for that. Uh, so now uh, we'll turn to our final uh, presentation and that will be Deborah Prince. And I will go ahead and read her bio. Uh, Deborah Prince started her career in standards uh, with U, uh, Underwriters Laboratory, or UL, in 1995. Uh, she worked in standards operations, then in global standards, where she was involved in implementing the STP standards development process. Currently, she is the director of standards programs. These programs include augmented reality, virtual reality, medical devices, software safety, cybersecurity, and the ULSE's autonomous suite of standards, which include automotive, heavy trucks, unmanned aerial systems, LIDAR, and robotics. Uh, Deborah holds a BS in mechanical engineering from uh, the Missouri University of Science and Technology. And with that, we'd like to invite uh, Ms. Prince to begin your presentation. 
you, Dr. Thomas. I appreciate um, the opportunity today. So listening to um, the discussions that have come before me, the conversations have been around wearables and a variety of issues with wearables. I'm going to come at it from a, a different lens and talk about wearables and how do you know that they're safe. And this is particularly in the fact of virtual reality, augmented reality, rich mixed reality, um, technical equipment. So Yoel, um, Standards and Engagement has a standard that has recently been published called UL 8400 that addresses this, these issues and risk and, and providing a platform that you know um, the type of risk have been addressed. All right, and sorry. Okay, yeah, we can see your slides. It did okay, before. great. Great. All right, so I'm gonna spend a little second letting everyone know who UL Standards and Engagement are. So we are a company that is, we like to say we are safety science in action. We are a global nonprofit. Um, we developed our first standard over 100 years ago. It was 10 clad doors. It's still being used today, and it was published in 1903. We develop standards using an open, transparent process. We have over 1,700 standards in our portfolio. We have a staff of over 100 dedicated staff. We're growing rapidly. That number is probably closer to the upper end of the hundreds right now. We are located in eight different countries. We have participants in our balanced committees from 600, or 60 plus countries. Um, of those consensus body members, there are 4,000 or more. We have an additional bank of participants that are, we call stakeholders who like to follow along, but they may not be on a committee um, to vote. And we have over 50,000 of those. And we have over 400 um, individual members, our committees in existence. So let's move on to why did we develop a standard and how did we develop the standard um, to address AR, VR, MR? We were approached um, by CPSC and they had had a lot of um, incidents reports on injuries. And they also had done a summer study. And a lot of these injuries were situations of falls, um, not knowing the surroundings, and a variety of other issues. In February 2020, we started the work on what will become UL 8400. We formed a committee, we moved forward. In March 31st, we had our first in 2020, we had our first in-person technical committee meeting to be scheduled. However, as everyone knows, mid-March, COVID shut down the world. So instead, we had a ton of virtual meetings where we went over a first draft. We had a lot of test task groups. We went over a second draft. We had some more meetings, some more task groups. And finally, in March, the end of March, UL 8400 was published. It's a national standard in the US and Canada that can be used anywhere in the world. So what's in 8400? Well, first of all, let's talk about that it is not something that can be used standalone because the risk that are identified there are not all the risk in the product. So it needs to be used in conjunction with a standard such as CAN CSA um, 6236-8-1 or UL 6236-8-1. A lot of numbers there, but basically what that standard, those two standards are, they're harmonized, are consumer electronics standards. So they're going to give you the electrical risk, the any kinds of electronic risk, and make sure you have a baseline of safety, you have fire shock and safety handled. Now there's a variety of different ways equipment is used in uh, different products in the marketplace. So one way to address 
all the different types of products is that you'll have to use a risk assessment in the standard. And like I said, it was developed using an open process, using the committee that we call our technical committee. Also, the technical committee had representatives from a variety of countries involved. So the standard looked, decided how to categorize um, the different types of products that are out there. We decided to look at um, non-see-through. So you, you've got a hazard in that hardware. Non-see-through means there's total optical occlusion. So again, you can't see through it. Video see-through, so it's opaque, but it has some video um, pass through the cameras and then optical see-through. So most of the user's vision is still maintained. So what's covered by UL8400? So we have see-through visual functions. So that's going to be covered and needs to be addressed during a risk assessment, most of that, those functions. What kind of ambient light levels are intended to be used with the product? Or can it be used outside? Can it be used inside? Can it be in a dark room or not? Also, they need to address the kind of use cases. If there's poor visibility, such as in an industrial environment, the headset being used, and maybe there's heavy equipment nearby, machinery that could cause a, a risk to the user. And then any kind of risk that come into effect from the lens filters on visibility. We also, the standard also addresses flicker. So flicker is, um, we're worried about any kind of biological effects induced by strobing. Um, and the standard requires that that's minimized to the extent possible. You don't want something that would trigger epilepsy per se or something like that. Skin compatibility is important. And really the concern there is prolonged skin contact. So you need to make sure any of the materials that come in contact with the skin, again, for a prolonged period of time, are made of something that will not um, cause a rash, cause burns, cause any um, harm to the skin. In addition, we need to look at, the standard also looks at and requires that um, the recommended cleaning practices are addressed and recommended by the manufacturer's cleaning process, knowing that um, you can't control how somebody cleans a product, but how they're recommended to be cleaned is important and that those products do not affect the skin that is being, that is being used in cleaning. You also need to look at exposure of the eyes to thermal energy. So that's heat. You can't have um, um, a headset providing too much heat that could damage the retina, the lasers. So you look at lasers and other stresses there. Um, biometric stress. So what you're really looking for there is any um, problems with the upper cervical spine, so compression. And when I get to that point, I guess a good point here to bring up is that the standard is you intended for anyone over the age of 12. There's really not science there yet for us to um, have good numbers on what you would do for a child. We're hoping in first further revisions, there'll be more data and we can um, um, address younger ages with the standard. So, and also within the biomedical stress, biometric stress, sorry, not biomedical, you look at some mechanical robustness. So there's tests to break the glass and make sure there's no, um, it doesn't mean that the unit won't break is dropped. It's simulating misuse, foreseeable misuse. And it doesn't mean the unit won't break, but it is making sure that it doesn't break to the fact that there could be um, harm to the user, like cutting their eye or, or cutting their face. In addition, we wanna make sure when you're doing these drop tests and, and um, verifying robustness that there's no harm to the battery pack. These are using lithium ion batteries. Those can get very hot. You can damage the unit. Um, any damage to the unit 
when charging could potentially cause problems with buyers and different things like that. So we need to make sure um, that these units are very robust. All right, we have the enhanced spatial perception. So you're looking at whether something is mobile or static and, and how you use it. Do you know your boundaries, different things like that. There are standard addresses, safety and warning instructions, as well as functional safety. So does the unit function as intended and is it safe? Deb, I hate to interrupt. We have about a, I've been told we have about a minute. If you could uh, wrap up quickly, thank you. Absolutely. This is pretty much my last bigger slide. So warning and labeling, all of this is done through a risk assessment. You need to look at basic health and safety information, preparation of a safe environment, preparation of the device, safe use of the product and accessories, maintenance and storage, your vulnerable age groups. So your elderly, again, we're not talking about 12 and under, so they're not. And then a first use tutorial. And last but not least, what does the future hold? We're already under continuous maintenance, which means we're getting back together. We're going to advance the standard to address more things um, and other risks that haven't been put in there yet. And we're also going to look at, do we need to expand the scope? Do we need to look at other technologies as this continues to expand? Things like that. So um, I want to leave you with, if anyone is interested in participating on that, please reach out and I would love to get you engaged. All right. With that, I will go ahead and turn it back over to you, Dr. Thomas, and thank everyone for the time. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Prince. It, that was an excellent presentation. I think shows the uh, the other side of the technology, the the importance of standards and developing good safety practices. So thank you very much uh, for that. Just a reminder, everyone, uh, that you can uh, provide questions into the Slido. And it will go ahead then. I think uh, Dr. Horney and I will trade off uh, with the questions. Uh, Jennifer, would you like to start with the first one? I was gonna say, you've got the mic if you wanna go first or. Okay. Uh, Let's see. Um, okay. Uh, this is to uh, Dr. Tiffany Powell Wiley. How effective is the tailored message uh, intervention for your community uh, folks to increase exercise? Do you have specific outcomes data? Do you have economics analysis data? Do people stop responding to texts after a while? So we are um, still analyzing data. So we're not uh, near the completion of the study. So I can't give all of um, that information. We, we did pilot testing that uh, showed that the um, tailored messaging, the location-based messaging increased uh, physical activity um, over the over the um, standard messaging, um, it approached statistical significance, but didn't reach statistical significance. But um, we're that the goal of this of uh, the full study is to test that um, that uh, to test that um, as our as our primary outcome. Um, and of course, we would want to see the cost effectiveness of this of the um, intervention as well. But we are. Very, um, please stay tuned. That's the best advice I have. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, for that answer, uh, Jennifer. Do you want to ask the next question? Sure. Um, so it looks like we had uh, a few questions about the concept of uh, cognitive liberty and maybe some um, discussion about how that may relate to. Children and there was some some conversation in the um, in the chat, but um, I wonder if we could um, maybe have a little bit more discussion about um, it, how that relates to empowering parents and uh, diagnoses and other um, tracking for uh, childhood 
um, biomarkers and neurological um, sequelae. Why don't I weigh in a little bit on that, uh, Jennifer? Yeah. So, um, so part of um, how uh, I've been talking about cognitive liberty in this context is to really recognize that it's like liberty as we understand it in the digital age and the age of, of sensors and wearable technology um, isn't just about a right from interference with privacy or a right from um, you know, security against the kinds of discrimination or misuse, but it's really about a right to self-determination, which includes a right to informational self-access, um, a right to uh, be able to use that information to improve one's in you know the context of brain, brain health and wellness and um, you know capability of decision making. And so if we're looking at children, you know, this matters in thinking about their right to cognitive liberty, their right to be able to develop cognitive freedoms, capabilities, um, which includes mental agility, um, relational intelligence, which includes emotional intelligence, um, and their capacities and competencies. And so if there, you know, is in the pediatric population, the struggle over, you know, the, the use of wearables, for example, and the potential, you know, implications from a privacy perspective, it's also really important to think about the cultivation of those capabilities in children. Those capabilities, especially in children, are critical to their ongoing development, to their ability to further, you know, engage over their lifetime um, in self-determining choices. Uh, and so, you know, in this context, thinking about that, I think it's really about um, how do you ensure that, you know, if there are a necessary set of stimuli, for example, if they need to be able to, to hear better, to be able to see better, to be able to process information or have different kinds of stimulus um, to enable that cognitive development, that those will be crucial inputs to their development to cultivation of cognitive liberty. And so, you know, this is what I've been working on a lot is thinking about not just what does that mean at the human rights level, but what does that mean for cultivation, you know, from well beyond the regulatory space, but investment in research that enables that investment in policies and ethical um, guidance that would really focus on doing so, whether it's in children or in adults. Great. So um, I'll, I'll ask one more, um, Trey, if you don't mind. So um, this was related to some of the information about COVID surveys leading to different predictions for different groups of people when comparing the two models. Um, how did patient replies differ between represented and underrepresented groups? And do you think that the two groups had different COVID symptoms? Yeah, so that's actually a really great question. So um, there's a couple different ways that we can look at uh, the responses. So obviously the Fitbit data that underlie the COVID um, diagnosis is uh, objective, but we did ask a self-reported question of whether or not somebody was diagnosed with COVID and what the date was. So um, there's a couple interesting things that we found. So in our representative population of about a thousand people, over a time frame of um, August of, of 2021 to uh, April of 2022, we had about 300 COVID positive cases in a thousand people in that time frame, which is actually a very a pretty high sample size for a lot of these digital health studies. So if you look at a lot of the um, other literature that has been published in this space, you see sample sizes of 200 to 300 out of about 20,000 people or 30,000 people recruited to get a similar sample size, right? So that shows, first of all, how a representative sample size can give you a higher disease prevalence because you're fundamentally looking at a more represented a population, right? Rather than a population that is more highly educated and therefore potentially staying at home and being able to work from home. Um, so that's point number one. Um, the second point is that we had a much higher representation of obviously of, of underserved individuals in our sample. We had, we had a higher proportion of people who were infected who were African-American, a higher proportion of people who were infected who worked in, in jobs that did not allow them to work from home. Whereas in a lot of these BYOD samples, not only is that data not 
reported, um, given the intrinsic composition of the sample, we would not be able to get at that. So we did see differences in who was getting COVID in our sample, number one. And number two, um, there are differences in the signal. So for example, um, we saw that certain groups, for example, women um, had a higher uh, had had bigger differences in, for example, sleep patterns than men um, during their COVID infection. So we're trying we're in the process of teasing those mechanisms out, but there are differences in phenotype by sociodemographic status as well. Great. Did you lose your I am back. Oh, there you are. Okay. okay. <laughs> you were having frozen some, for a minute. Yeah, I'm having some connectivity issues, but uh, we'll we'll march on. Uh, would you like for me to ask a, a couple of questions? We have a couple sure. of good ones here. Well, one I, I think is for uh, could be answered by several uh, panelists, and it says, Claudia, uh, data from wearable sensors should be recorded continuously." and over the lifetime of all individuals involved in a given cohort uh, data. So this is actually, I think, more of a, oh, a, a, given a given cohort. So it's actually starting with the statement, data should be stored for potential future analysis. Uh, how do you envision meeting the challenges of a multi-decade data collection and storage uh, and privacy issues? And this has really come up, I know, including but not limited to uh, personal health information, GPS location, relationships among cohort participants. Very interesting question. So would anyone like to take that on? I'll be happy to jump in on that, which is, um, you know, I think obviously there are huge questions from a storage perspective, which I won't touch on, but thinking about it from a privacy perspective, um, it raises significant challenges over the long haul, um, not just uh, you know, I think it's both important for the individual as well as for, you know, the value that will come of the data and the kinds of insights that we can gain as a result, but it also increases the risks of longer term harms, both in terms of kind of additional things and insights that you could gain from it. Or, you know, if you take it from a brain sensor perspective, looking at things like the rate of cognitive decline over time, who has access to that? How is it used? What kinds of policies does that inform? Um, is it used by employers? Is it used as part of wellness programs and collected in the context of wellness programs? Is it you know, used to make discriminatory and other choices? To me, given the likelihood of re-identification of most of this data, particularly as the um, you know, data becomes richer and more associated with other data sets over time, it's really important that we think about securing against misuse rather than securing against access, because I think access restrictions to the data are kind of a short-term solution to what will become a long-term, longitudinal data set that will open up kinds of different kinds of risks of harm over time. And so my hope is um, that that's what we'll really focus on is trying to identify proactively and regularly what the potential risks of discrimination and misuse of those data are and by which actors, and then to put into place rights and remedies to protect against that. Great. Anyone else for that question? All right. And I do have a follow-up uh, that, that's also very interesting. Uh, how do you overcome trust issues with wearable devices in, in vulnerable populations uh, who are concerned about data being sold and or used against them in some way? Uh, for example, higher insurance costs, et cetera. I, for whatever reason, I lost the first part of that conversation. It looks like Ritiga wanted to take that on. Did you want to take that on? I saw sure. That. I mean, I'm, I'm happy to start, actually. So in our experience, we found that the major barrier to wearable ownership in vulnerable and underserved populations is not necessarily privacy and data security issues, but it's primarily access. Um, they're, they don't know about uh, what wearable devices exist. They don't know the benefits of wear, wearable devices, and so they don't engage. Um, and we find that if we provide education and we provide the, the wearable device free of cost, that, that reduces most of the barriers. And we don't find that 
people from vulnerable backgrounds participate at any rate less than uh, than the general population. It's it, it's pretty much equalized at that point. However, um, beyond that, um, for the people who do express privacy and data concerns, it's really about establishing relationships. In our experience, we find that in our experience with establishing this panel over a decade, a decade and counting, having an ongoing participant narrative, um, providing feedback to participants about the, the usefulness of their data, um, uh, engaging them in, in why these research questions are important, especially for, for people uh, from underserved backgrounds, really goes a long way in, in instilling trust. And, but that's just our two cents from our experience. Just to add with our experience, um, we've done uh, focus groups and uh, as far as part of our pilot testing, just to understand how um, mobile apps and uh, wearables are used or what interests um, exist in digital health uh, interventions in the communities we've worked in. And I would echo that the, the interest is certainly there and um, it, it really is about, it's not even necessarily about access to device to the phone, of course, it's more access to the wearables and, and learning, um, the, um, but the, the, it's, and it's not, um, it's really uh, learning um, how they can be used and, and coupled with their phones and things like that. But the interest in using mobile apps and, and particularly using mobile apps for health related issues is there and it's happening they're doing that it's just how do we incorporate more uh, digital tools in there but I've um, the, the, the populations we work with um, as a part of our intervention are really excited about being a part of these types of studies and doing and being and having these types of studies focus on African-American women for instance um, so we we'll definitely get a lot of that feedback Great answers. Unfortunately, this has been an, an incredible session, and I uh, we really appreciate all of your insights. Uh, this is fascinating work, uh, but unfortunately, we'll have to wrap up. Jennifer, do you have any final comments before we turn it over? No, I think we're ready to uh, introduce the next session, which is session five on the future direction of wearables, um, moderated by our very um, <laughs> good um, leader here of the uh, committee workshop. And we'll turn it over to her. Thank you so much, Jennifer, for all your hard work and for your generous remarks. Um, I'm very excited to open up session five. Just as a brief uh, reminder and introduction, my name is Rima Haber. I'm an associate professor in environmental health and at the Spatial Sciences Institute at the University of Southern California. I'm very excited to welcome you to our fifth and final session of this amazing workshop on identifying the research gaps, limitations, and future directions for wearables in environmental health and biomedical research. I'm also very grateful to our two invited guests, Dr. Joseph Wang of UC San Diego and Dr. Ed Ramos of Scripps Research and Care Evolution to have joined us in this final discussion session and future looking session. Um, I'd like to briefly introduce Dr. Wang before we give him the floor for a brief lightning talk and then do the same with Dr. Ramos and then we'll have a great discussion at the end. Uh, so please be prepared with your questions when we get there. So briefly, Dr. Joseph Wang is a distinguished professor, SAIC endowed professor at the Department of Nanoengineering at University of California, San Diego. After holding a Regents Professor and Manas Chair positions at NMSU, he moved to ASU where he served as the director of the Center for Bioelectronics and Biosensors at the Biodesign Institute. He joined the UC San Diego Nanoengineering Department in 2008. He is a member of the US National Academy of Inventors and of the Turkish National Academy of Sciences. Dr. Wang holds honorary professor titles from eight different universities and is the recipient of two National American Chemical Society Awards for Electrochemistry and Instrumentation of the Electrochemical Society Sensors Achievement Award the Charles N. Riley SIAC Electroanalytical Award, and the Ralph Adams Pitkin Award in Bioanalytical Chemistry. 
He served as the founding chief editor of the Wiley Journal Electroanalysis and on the editorial board of 20 other journals. Dr. Wang is also a fellow of the RSC, PCS, and AIMBE. His research interests include bioelectronics and biosensors, wearable sensor systems, nanomotors and micro robots, and flexible materials. He has authored over 1,200 research papers, 12 books, 55 patents, and 35 chapters, and he was ranked as the most cited electrochemist in the world in 1995 and as the most cited researcher in engineering during 1995 till 2005. And with that, I'd like to welcome Dr. Wang and ask him to please take the floor for his brief lightning talk. Thank you. Yes. So again, thank you, Rima, Natalie, and thank you all for staying so late. So I'm from uh, UC San Diego in the Pacific Ocean in La Hoya, and we'll talk about the wearable sensor for environmental security and we were working on this for the last uh, decade on the chemical sensor. So we know that the, the topic started with a physical sensor for mobility, vital sun, what we have in the market. What we would like to add is uh, to introduce molecular information, and go beyond the mobility, vital sun, and introduce really looking at chemical, uh, both for security and environmental application, any time, any location. So we rely on electrochemical sensor for three decades for both mobile device and wearable devices. We started the 90s, lot of wearable for toxic metal and nerve agent. And the last decade we work on wearable, wearable for, again, uh, security and environmental application. And again, the best example of success story in terms of in the field is the lesson from diabetic, from glucose, over the past four decades, we see moving from bench top, a large instrument to this disposable strip in the mid nineties. And now we have the wearable, this is a needle like a CGM. This is the only, only success story, the big market, multi-billion dollar driven by the diabetic. So this is an example of moving over three decades it took to go to the self-disposable strip, field device to on body sensing. And the advantages of all this are uh, the continuous monitoring. We have continuous information about environmental exposure, any time and location 24 seven. So this can be for medical, for security, for wellness and uh, uh, other applications. So this is a real time 24 seven data. And we can have a temporal profile of environmental hazard again, uh, over a long period. And again, this is done if it's biomarker, we don't need to do blood sample, no need to pierce the skin. It's uh, changing the way we do the environmental and uh, else uh, monitoring, both for civilian and soldier. We do a lot with the military for exposure for uh, danger. So these are major advantages. And, uh, but the only success story is the glucose. So well, let's see what are the limitations, what are the gaps, what are the challenges. You know, we are trying to move this big laboratory, the standard, the classical traditional laboratory to have a lab on the skin. So it's a nice vision. We would like to have all the lab, all the lab operation to do it on the skin, under the skin, in the mouth, on the contact lens. But there are major gap and major challenges in placing the lab, complete lab on the skin and get reliable result, reproducible results. So this is the main question and the major challenges, both performance challenges and the engineering challenges. So we will see there are a variety of challenges related to energy, reliability of the data, uh, data safety, data security. So all of this uh, we will see the next uh, three minutes. Uh, we go more detail is the performance, uh, let's say a gap in the performance, unlike the lab where we have major challenges compared to standard laboratory in terms of the scope of the measurement, the accuracy, the stability. Again, stability is a concern because we are working outdoor condition. The temperature in Phoenix now is 110 degrees. This enzyme cannot survive. It's not like in room temperature in the lab, a changing condition. 
And then we need to validate everything you need to compare to the gold standard, which is the classical, let's say for FDA approval, we need the building calibration. And overall, we want to ensure the reliability of the result are not compromised. Let me use my laser pointer. So we want to make sure that the reliability, accuracy are not compromised. We talk about, uh, we have uh, safety, uh, safety is more if you do uh, measurement on the skin, on the eye, under the skin, biocompatibility. Now, many of the assay we do in the lab, like immuno assay, they are not reversible and cannot be adapted to on-body operation. They have multiple steps. So like a typical ELISA immuno assay in the lab, but uh, for a uh, different trace uh, a chemical, we cannot do it on the body yet. Uh, issue with the compliance with the body, the flexible device, you want to match the property of the device with the tissue, you need material innovation, uh, energy demand was uh, uh, powering the device, the communication, wireless communication, we have challenges. And we talk about big data, uh, processing the data, data security, data safety, data privacy, and finally, the scalability of this device, low cost, large scale manufacturing, along with the regulatory, the FDA approval. So these are major gaps and major challenges, but we are not giving up and we are trying to address these challenges. Again, in our lab, we are working on wearable, not only to monitor the environment, but Different biomarker, uh, you're putting sensor on the skin for sweat monitoring, saliva monitoring using mouse guard, uh, tears monitor with contact lens and micro needle for ISF. But a lot of this is monitoring the surrounding environment for environmental and security as a, all about molecular biomarker. We can analyze this sweat, saliva, tear, looking for metabolite like glucose, alcohol, electrolyte, sodium, potassium, drug like opioid, uh, cortisol, hormone, stress biomarker, disease biomarker, nutrition, again, chemical agent, toxic metal, and many more using our wearable. So I'll give you a few examples. A few examples from my lab. This is, for example, a glove that we use for swiping, looking for explosive residue and nerve agent a, a residue. So we have one finger for swiping, one for detection, connect to a portable device. The same is for nerve agent, a textile-based sensor. You see the electronic is flexible as enzyme OPH to uh, selective through the nerve agent. Or we have micro needles that want to uh, check exposure for opioid or nerve agent. One sensor is for the opioid and one for the nerve agent. So you can distinguish between episodes of poisoning with this or this. Or another example is a ring that we develop for exposure, both explosive and uh, nerve agent. You see all the electronic is integrated inside the ring. Uh, this is a work for the Navy here on San Diego for exposure for explosive residue on a wetsuit. Or this is again for military application for nerve agent on textile. So these are some examples. And again, we see tremendous progress over the past decade for chemical sensing for all these uh, micro needle, mouse guard, skin, glove. But there is again major gaps that I discuss and we will review. So overall, the techniques are very promising, but uh, despite of this major progress, there's still major gap in performance for reliability and scope. But we can address this with multidisciplinary approach, people from different fields, and hopefully the field will move very fast. And like in the case of diabetics, they find new commercial possibility to accelerate this uh, possibility for own body environmental and security measurement. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Wang. We appreciate it. Um, I would like to just remind our audience that we will take all our questions during the Q&A session at the very end. Um, and with that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Ed Ramos. Thank you so much for being here. Um, briefly, Dr. Ramos is the Chief Scientific Officer at Care Evolution and co-founder of the Digital 
Trial Center and Director of, Clin of Digital Clinical Trials at Scripps Research. Dr. Ramos' work is based on the growing need to rethink clinical research studies by leveraging digital health technologies and embracing decentralized sightless approaches, which can promote broad participation without sacrificing robust data collection. Dr. Ramos's leadership role focuses on overseeing the implementation of digital research studies in a variety of contexts, including infectious disease, maternal health, sleep medicine, and precision nutrition, where he serves as the primary investigator. Dr. Ramos prioritizes efforts to address health disparities and to enhance participation in a diverse, equitable, and inclusive manner, which we know is very important. Prior to this dual role, he served in the federal government for nearly 15 years. There, he led independent research projects and has been coordinating and administering large-scale national research efforts. His expertise spans population genomics, bioinformatics, mobile health, and digital clinical trials. In his previous position, serving in various capacities at the NIH, Dr. Ramos oversaw and managed portfolios that focus on innovative and groundbreaking initiatives aimed at improving public health. Most recently, Dr. Ramos was team lead for the Participant Center of the All of Us Research Program, an ambitious pro program launched by N NIH inviting 1 million people across the US to help build one of the most diverse health databases in history, which could help in the development of better treatments and ways to prevent different diseases. Dr. Ramos began his federal service as a legislative fellow and legislative assistant, advising then US Senator Barack Obama on health and science policy. He received his PhD in molecular biotechnology from the University of Washington with his thesis work carried out at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center. And with that, the floor is all yours, Dr. Ramos. Thank you. Thanks, Rima. I uh, appreciate it. Thank you for the invite and congratulations on what's been an amazing workshop to you and team. Uh, I'm just going to share some brief thoughts. Uh, we've had a tremendous amount of discussion around uh, specific technologies, the vision of where these technologies can potentially take us in the environmental space. Uh, and as much as I like to geek out uh, with the next person in terms of these different devices, I wanted to take a step back and think about uh, how we think about implementing these technologies and what it means to actually bring it into a clinical research study, uh, considerations in terms of uh, participant enrollment and so on. So I'll, I'll start with how we typically view potential challenges and roadblocks in the traditional clinical trial model in which the physical brick and mortar facility is really front and center and that really what is what governs a lot of the decision-making process around um, how you structure and design uh, different elements of a clinical trial or a clinical research study. And with that, potentially brings with it uh, challenges and uh, also limitations in terms of recruitment. So for example, if you are a regional academic medical center or a specific provider system, uh, you're typically building your cohort from the surrounding patient populations. And the challenges there is that you may be limited to uh, uh, a certain demographic that may not actually pertain to the research questions or may not be representative of the research questions at hand. In addition, we think a lot about what is the burden on participants. So uh, there are a lot of statistics there um, around how typically how close uh, clinical trial, clinical research sites are to an individual. I believe the average time, something around 70 to 80% of participants that are um, accessing a clinical trial uh, typically need to travel around two hours to get there. So you're thinking about now, how do they take time off? How do they access the site and so on and so forth? Uh, there's also resource dependent issues in terms of building that study coordinator team, ensuring that you have expertise uh, and, uh, of course, having trained professionals for things like biosample collection. And a lot of the data that's collected is limited to the time that you have that participant in that brick and mortar facility, which makes it very episodic in terms of the collection. And so COVID-19 really kind of ushered in a new lens um, that really catalyzed a paradigm shift in terms of how we 
can potentially move clinical trials out of these brick and mortar facilities and more into people's homes. And this is typically referred to as the decentralization of clinical trials. So a decentralized clinical trial doesn't necessarily have to have a digital component and a digital research study doesn't necessarily have to be decentralized, but it's really the marriage of these two where we start seeing some exciting things in terms of how we can view the construction of these uh, study designs in a different way. So moving from that potentially restricted patient population to really anyone, anywhere, and opening that up in terms of access, removing the burden of having the participant get to a physical site, but really being able to do it in the comfort of their own home, leveraging technologies like a smartphone to be able to build a study app and say, uh, and provide a self-guided experience. Um, and with that has the positive kind of downstream impact of not necessarily needing to build a huge study coordinator team, but really focusing on the participant experience as it's delivered uh, digitally through, through a smartphone study app. Uh, and then uh, also leveraging innovations for things that you may not consider as something that can be done in a decentralized way, like biosample collection. We have studies that collect saliva and blood and stool. Again, all things that are done in a self-administered way. And then, of course, most germane to our conversation today in this workshop is talking about all these technologies really give you this ability to not only collect data in a continuous way, but do it in such a way that it's collected in a real world context. And that real world data allows for an eventual kind of uh, uh, analysis to get towards and drive towards real world evidence for a variety of different research questions that we may have. Uh, and again, specific to the environmental space as it relates to this particular workshop. So a proof of concept, uh, I'll just kind of leave you with the, the Digital Trial Center at Scripps Research has been successful in implementing this across a variety of different research modalities. As Rima mentioned, uh, we have interest in the sleep medicine space, the precision nutrition space, the maternal health space, infectious disease, and hopefully you can easily see how these can be adapted for a variety of different research contexts. Uh, especially environmental science and the impact uh, on, on the public health perspective. So appreciate the time and just wanted to give that quick setup and, and excited to jump into conversation here. Thank you very much, Ed. And um, thank you both, Dr. Wang and Dr. Ramos. I'd like to just remind our audience quickly that the Q&A function is below the video player in Slido. So please put in your questions there. And with that, I'll take us to our Q&A session um, with both spe speakers. And honestly, I don't think we'll manage to ask you all the questions that are so interesting coming from our discussions today, but maybe to start us off, um, you know, I know Dr. Ramos, you mentioned this and it's very important in your work, the issues of diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility remain front and center, um, you know, in this space wearables for precision environmental health and for medical care delivery. So maybe starting with you and then we'll move to Dr. Wang. What in your opinion, or how are we, how well are we doing in this space in your opinion? Are we being sort of proactive in thinking and designing for diversity, equity, inclusion, accessibility? Are we lacking anything in this vision? What could help accelerate us getting there from any dimensions or examples or sort of lessons learned from your work? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, as you know, we could have a whole nother workshop on this particular topic, but it's important to raise. And there were some great comments in the previous session with regards to recognizing the need for diverse cohorts. Um, so to answer your question quite bluntly, I don't think we're ever doing a really good job in the health disparity space. Um, in terms of what we could potentially do. But where I get excited is that this really is a paradigm shift. So we really are rethinking how we do clinical trials and clinical research. So we're at this beginning stages of a decentralized digital clinical research model that we're still figuring out how to do it. And we, and I, I think we, we owe it to underrepresented and underserved populations to prioritize them rather than to say, you know what, we'll figure this out in the majority populations first, and then we'll get back to you and figure it out. And the problem there is that we start developing an infrastructure that is suitable for only a subset of the representative population. And by the time you get to other populations and other communities, 
there needs to be additional activation energy and additional efforts and resources to put forth uh, addressing some of the very specific contexts that they bring within their communities. So things like uh, recognizing that not everyone has an Apple Watch, <laughs> that there are gaps in service with regards to bandwidth issues in rural communities, that there may be trust issues um, specific to certain communities around their sharing of uh, digital health data, uh, that we have to examine what our security principles are with regards to how we uh, not only ingest data, but also how do we secure it uh, as, a, as a research team. Uh, in addition to recognizing that um, we should be figuring out how to communicate what are these what these new technologies are. And I think there's uh, I've had a lot of conversations in which we can easily slip into an ageist, uh, kind of framework where we say, oh, you know, the older population won't know how to do this. So we're going to set them aside. And uh, I think some of the successes we've had is that we've shown uh, and and that that's just not true. <laughs> uh, I always bring my mom up who's, you know, getting close to 80 years old. And she's been my number one participant in darn near all of my studies. Um, and uh, I, I've been pleasantly surprised at, at really her ability to navigate and it's been a tremendous amount of feedback from her to say, this isn't clear, this isn't right, or uh, you have to think about finger strength for this particular device. So a variety of different things. And again, I can go on and on in this particular topic area, but it's uh, I'll, I'll end by reiterating, this is our opportunity to prioritize a lot of populations and communities that we typically skip over and wait for the second round to come around. Um, and so I, I think we, we have an opportunity to really make that our prim primary lens. Thank you so much. And Dr. Wang, I'd love to also hear your thoughts on this issue and perhaps from your you know, technology and global perspective as well. I think Ed covered it nicely. I mean, we're developing the technology. The key is that the personnel in my labs are very diverse. My student postdoc who will be in the field, they're all from very diverse population here in the UC. Again, some of the luxury item, you know, if you do wearable for wellness or nutrition, this is more depend on the on the on how rich you are. But the, most of the one for protection of the civilian or soldier, here there is no uh, discrimination between different uh, different populations. So it's not like uh, the as you mentioned, the Apple Watch people use it for wellness, recreation, personal nutrition. This uh, we need to improve that it will be available to. But when it comes to protection against uh, environmental hazard or uh, uh, nerve agent, this is, should be general available to all the population. And on that note, perhaps I'll ask one more of my questions and then we'll make sure to get the audience questions in as well. So you mentioned, you know, your team is highly interdisciplinary, and I think from all the examples we've seen today, this is such a highly transdisciplinary field, and you need so much expertise, as Dr. Bansali also mentioned before, and as Ed, you mentioned, perhaps like the, the teams at play in running these studies now are shifting and changing and so on. So at least in my experience, I still feel like it's very challenging, or the systems we work within are not very well built for interdisciplinary true collaboration. And I'd love to hear both your thoughts on what is it that we need to kind of help us break through these challenges and really work in highly transdisciplinary, you know, functioning environments. Perhaps Dr. Wang, if you'd like to start. No, in UCSD, we have a fantastic multidisciplinary. We work closely with the physician and and again, the whole environment is for equity and diversity, both in terms of training and accessibility. So we see no major barrier. I mean, the barrier is when people need to get expensive gadgets like Apple Watch and other, mainly for wellness and uh, nutrition, but not for medical or security application. Okay. Yeah, so uh, I'll add a perspective slightly different, although I agree with, with all of these points, I think the workforce is extremely important to recognize diversity in thought uh, as well as in, in background. Uh, but for, for us, uh, we've landed on one of the greatest assets in uh, developing our research efforts, and that's putting together our virtual advisory team. 
So not interdisciplinary in the sense of professional backgrounds and disciplines, whether it's engineers or technologists or computer scientists, but really uh, interdisciplinary if you think about the different roles that people have in our lives. So patient advocates and uh, industry, nonprofit organizers, grassroots organizers, uh, the stay-at-home mom. Uh, so that's, that's our interdisciplinary lens in terms of ensuring that we get those perspectives because our expertise really is in the implementation science. And we can't be experts in that implementation science if we don't have a recognition of what the different lenses are. Ultimately, this has to be useful at the human general population level when we talk about public health. And so we really try to kind of reverse engineer that and say, all right, well, who's actually using it? And how, how can we extract a lot of those insights? So interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary in terms of professional disciplines, 100%. We need technologists, we need clinicians, we need uh, uh, experts in public health, uh, we need regulatory experts, we need all of that. Um, what I'm just suggesting is that additional layer of what is the, the, the diversity and thought in terms of discipline with regards to the general public. That's very interesting. Um, thank you. And perhaps I'll take a question from the audience. This is director, directed sorry, to Dr. Wang. What do you see as the future of using tattoos or lab on the skin for monitoring analytes like glucose or environmental factors? And again, glucose is the best example. It's been, a, we all learned from glucose, from three decades of glucose. I remember, it started the 80s, people were dreaming about implantable glucose. So it took two decades until we realized this CGM, continuous glucose. But this is driven by the market. I don't think the environmental market is big enough. So but the same, we can use the same technology for other metabolite, electrolyte. But it's uh, each of these need the uh, investment and diabetics. There is a big company like Irdexcom or Abbott. Uh, they're investing billion because of the market. So the environmental market is relatively limited. We have the U.S. government for security applications. They're investing a lot for protecting the soldier. But I doubt that just the regular environmental will be major investment uh, unless there is some uh, requirement. But uh, what was the second question? It's mainly the... Uh, I, think, I think you addressed it. It's basically also for environmental factors, let's say, similar types of sensing. Because, uh, yeah, there is a really limited amount. The technology is available. We need somebody to invest in it to make, I mean, even the glucose company like Apple is dreaming to have a glucose on the watch and they're investing millions and still don't. So everything is challenging, especially for the chemical sensing. So with chemical sensing is a different challenge than mobility and vital signs, really the stability of this bioreceptor, the end and the end. They are not so stable for prolonged operation, outdoor, extreme condition in the desert and so on. Thank you. And I, I believe Bina mentioned that as well. We have a question specifically for Ed. What is the type of information that you are collecting with decentralized trials? And is it self-reported behavioral information? How confident are you of the accuracy of responses when there is no coordinator interviewing these respondents? That's a great question. Um, and, and dovetails a little bit with the previous one in terms of we can have specific sensing for environmental measures uh, but it's also important to recognize that we can layer on top of that other digital biomarkers that are still helpful to kind of understand the context, whether it's uh, measuring physical activity or sleep duration or resting heart rate or respiratory rate. All of these things, I think, could nicely complement more environmental specific sense and metrics that that we could glean. And so those are examples to the uh, initial part of that question in terms of different types of data we collect, you know, things that you would normally see off a, a wearable from a Fitbit or Garmin or whatever. We have the opportunity to use a study app to deploy a number of different surveys. And so with regards to uh, participant reported outcomes, that can be in the context of validated survey instruments. And we can get into things like um, anxiety disorder assessments or depressive disorder assessments, stress and mood, uh, all of these things that have validated instruments that have been deployed in the field in traditional studies. 
The last part is the trickiest one with regards to uh, how uh, how much can we uh, really put uh, stock into the accuracy of the, of the of the answers that are being delivered. So a couple of things. Um, one, I think this is probably most uh, a question that surfaced the most in a regulatory context, right? Mm -hmm. So when we're thinking about shifting this from a traditional research study to a, tradi to a traditional and formal clinical trial, you now have the lens of the FDA on top of that, where they're asking, the initial model was you're bringing a thousand people into one spot and one person's collecting the blood pressure. Now you're telling me that you're giving me a thousand blood pressure readings that were taken by a thousand different people. And what does that offer up in terms of accuracy and validity? And those are things that we just have to think through. And, and those are things that our team thinks through. And this is what we get excited about. Where are the challenges? How far can we push this? And how much can we really determine a signal above the noise of, of potential uh, inaccurate readings or readings that wouldn't necessarily be valid? And with that kind of blends the strategy of um, in ideal situations in which you can mimic the gold standard collection of a metric, yes, let's bring that into the workflow. But in, in, in instances in which you can't, uh, does a silver or a bronze uh, standard metric serve the, the, the appropriate purpose? And so for something like steps, uh, I wouldn't put any stock into the exact number of steps. But I would put stock into the delta of steps. So it may not be 10,000, but when you have recorded and create a baseline with an individual 10,000 steps, now all of a sudden they're walking 6,000 steps or 6,000 steps are being recorded. It's really that delta that we get most interested in and that we can do quite a bit with in terms of uh, profile analysis, trend analysis, and potentially even predictive analysis. So it's a great question. I wish I could say I've figured it out completely, but it's something that we certainly uh, are a front brain of all the time. It's very interesting. Thank you. I think the methodological sort of questions and, and ways we approach things are really fascinating now. And it's sort of a new world of how we think about doing these studies. The next question is from Claudio and our planning committee. And for both our speakers, maybe starting with Dr. Wang, um, in a futuristic world where we are all wearing sensors, providing us with information on real-time environmental exposures and health indicators, what do you think will be the balance between desensitization from data overload and changes in the use of consumer products available for everyday use in the marketplace? Meaning, will people sort of reach a point, how do you reach a point where people are not just overloaded with information and they're actually moving towards changes in their behaviors in a useful way. Oh, I agree. I mean, there are different uh, purpose. One purpose is to give you warning and alert in case of any exposure, sudden exposure that you need to take some uh, precaution. So this is different than have the continuous data temporal a profile of this uh, environmental and uh, like pollution in San Diego. But the main concern when there is a real sudden exposure and a warning, if you have uh, any, as we say, in the military for nerve agent or explosive, but the same for a civilian. So I don't think that the normal population worry about the long-term uh, temporal change, as long as they are within the limit of normal, uh, not exceeding, uh, level. So the main goal of this is to give an alert and warning for sudden sudden exposure from my point of view. So uh, another area that we think about quite a bit uh, in terms of behavior of the participant. And I, I, I think there is quite a bit of desensitization that we have to contend with because there is a significant amount of data overload that we get on a daily basis. So where we land, and this allows me to kind of bring up another important aspect that we focus on, is return of information, return of data, return of insights back to the participant. So if you start including them into this process of don't just give me all your data, but let me actually provide something back to you, I think that starts not only establishes trust and I think a meaningful relationship with the participant, but also gets them engaged and motivated and, and understanding. I think one of our successes um, and the glucose keeps coming up because uh, it, it's a great uh, uh, exemplar. But 
but we have a precision nutrition study in which we launched and which we provided a Dexcom G6. But we really needed to incentivize and motivate the participant to log their food to wear their Fitbit and do all of these other things that we were asking of them. Uh, in addition to the monetary incentive, financial incentive, which can help, it really ultimately what motivated them was showing them the real-time continuous glucose monitor readings overlaid with the macro nutritional information that they were recording from their food so that they can very intimately, because it's personal to them, see what this data means. And they actually were starting to understand the whole purpose of the study. I think back at some of my older studies that I used to run, and it was very much fly in, fly out, and the participant really didn't, their head was left spinning in terms of, well, what exactly did I actually just participate in? But being able to be a part of, oh, this is my information, and you're providing it back to me in a way that I can understand it and making meaningful, I think that's what can start chipping away at the desensitization because it starts really bringing this element of being meaningful for the participant. But that's really, really challenging and really difficult. <laughs> And, and I will say, Ed, thank you so much, because that was going to be my next question, and you already answered it, um, especially about returning information and getting to actionable results in an ethical, sort of, you know, useful, context-sensitive way. Um, we are at time for our Q&A session, and as I predicted, you know, I wish we could go on for another two hours, but I'd right, like to really thank Dr. Wang and Dr. Ramos for your time and for sharing your insights with us. Um, this has been tremendous. Um, for now, I'd like to move us all into closing remarks and thank you again to our two wonderful speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. So I hope everyone is still online with us. And this brings us to the last day and the last session and closing of our wearables workshop. I would like to express my sincerest gratitude to all our esteemed speakers who have shared their expertise and contributed to these discussions that have unfolded throughout the day. Your valuable insights and active engagement are really shaping this innovative field of wearable technologies for precision environmental health and for biomedical research, leaving a lasting and meaningful impression on our collective journey together. And I'm sure everybody online and watching us today feels the same. The first day of the wearables workshop covered a range of topics, including non-invasive monitoring techniques and the development of wearable devices. We explored discussions on improving personalized health tracking, monitoring indoor office design, which we learned, of course, is an area we spend a lot of our time in, over 90% of our days. We learned about utilizing silicon wristbands for personal exposure detection, particularly for vulnerable populations about wearables for air pollution monitoring and extreme heat, about monitoring warfighters' exposure to chemical hazards, and so much more. And today, on our second day, we just heard from leaders and innovators in interdisciplinary fields and the biomedical space. The session three speakers highlighted a variety of wearables and sensors to detect and collect physiological, biochemical, health, and environmental data, Data derived from wearables and other health data sources can then be used to train and develop machine learning algorithms for disease predictive models, for diagnostics, and for treatment. As a deeper dive, we heard from Dr. Mahalinga and Dr. Chang about the Women's Health Study with Harvard School of Public Health and Apple, which was used to track fertility and even exposure to wildfire smoke in women. Dr. Jessalyn Dunn's presentation focused on digital biomarkers and utilizing smartphone collected data transformed into predictive health indicators. So Dr. Dunn's use of machine learning classifiers, wearable measurements, and case studies further demonstrated the power of digital biomarkers in cardiovascular disease and diabetes monitoring. We also heard from Dr. David Armstrong, who highlighted the significance of wearables in managing diabetic foot complications, a common and often neglected issue with frequent amputations occurring every 20 seconds. Dr. Armstrong touched on the importance of providing patients with devices that compensate for their lack of pain sensation, such as smart boots, 
and exploring innovative sensors and approaches, including smart socks, smart shoes, insoles, and injectables to positively impact patient outcomes. And then we heard from Dr. Bina Misra on the ASSIST program that highlighted the advantages of long-term health monitoring and the need to understand the relationship between health and environmental toxins through innovative personalized wearable technologies. And then we just had our engaging panel discussion on understanding how technology adoption, implementation, report back and science communication factor into advancing biomedical and environmental health research. So, excuse me, I'm talking about session four, not our session five speakers just now, but session four speakers highlighted areas concerning data privacy, cognitive liberty, data equity, workforce development, community engagement, standards and regulations, and so much more. So just to give you a recap with a little bit more granularity, Dr. Nita Farahani's presentation explored the convergence of wearables and brain technology, highlighting the embedding of brain sensors into everyday devices, and the promising potentials of wearables for newer tech and the considerations around cognitive liberty. Dr. Ritika Chattaverdi discussed health data for equitable precision health. Dr. Chattaverdi's research focuses on biases in wearable studies, emphasizing the need for sociodemographic representation, for developing benchmark data sets and adherence to fair data standards and principles in AI and machine learning research. You then heard from Dr. Shikar Bansali, on the use of wearables in public health and the challenges of interdisciplinary training, highlighting the need to update and enhance educational curricula to effectively address these areas and attract talented individuals and students and trainees, while also discussing the influence of social, social media driven hype. Dr. Tiffany Powell Wiley discussed her community engaged research approaches in several Washington, D.C. communities at high risk for cardiovascular diseases. She is we using wearable technology to discover how neighborhoods and other environments influence the development of obesity, diabetes, and other markers of cardiometabolic risk. And then we heard from Ms. Deborah Prince about the importance and the reasons why UL developed standards for the safety of virtual reality, augmented reality, and other wearables technologies, highlighting the process for how to develop appropriate standards. And lastly, moving on to our session five group discussion that we just had on the future of wearable technologies, we discussed the current state of wearables, future approaches and gaps and challenges we expect in getting there to the promise of wearables for all these applications. We had Dr. Joseph Wang discuss innovative approaches to wearables such as gloves for chemicals detection, innovative data collection, and so much more. And we also had Dr. Ed Ramos during his lightning talk discuss a future beyond clinical trials, one that is decentralized and really focused on the patient and participant experience. So over the course of these two days, we have witnessed the conversions of brilliant minds and groundbreaking ideas in the realm of wearable technologies. As we bring this wearables workshop to a close, we do, though with a, we do so with a deep appreciation for the knowledge we gained, for the perspectives shared, for the collective commitment to advancing this field, I would like to extend a huge thanks to everyone involved in making this workshop such a huge success. And we encourage you all to join the standing committee on the use of emergence, emerging sciences for environmental health decisions, June 14th through June 15th for our sister workshop on advances in multimodal artificial intelligence to enhance environmental and biomedical data integration. I would also personally like to thank our amazing planning committee and program managers and leaders in getting us here. And with that, we hope you have a great rest of your day. And this concludes our final day two of the National Academy of Sciences Wearables Workshop. Thank you, everyone.